All right, everyone, we're live. Great. Uh, we have a quorum. Uh, it's 9.02. Um, this is the uh, BOE budget workshop for January 25th, 2021. We're scheduled to go from nine to noon today. Um, so we have uh, quite a bit of work to do today. Um, you know, I think the last meeting was good, but we, you know, we, I think on a couple of things, we went a little bit off topic on things that are very important, relevant, and very strategic, but not necessarily uh, focused on getting to the bottom line in terms of this budget. So I thought the first thing we should do this morning is to actually go through the list of cuts, the original list, as well as the stress test, and, and actually decide which things we're going to take, which things we're not, kind of so we know what the bottom line is, and then we can go from there. Um, I would hold off on question, on, on going through the Q&A for, you know, right now. Uh, I think that after we kind of regroup on where we think the bottom line is, um, we should probably have a discussion about where we're going to go from there. And I suggest that on, on the Q&A responses that we focus on the ones that are probably the most most material uh, and not go through every every answer line by nine. But you know, when we get to that, we'll we'll decide. Um, so Phil, um, by the way, we have basically this week on Thursday, we really need to vote on a budget. Um, so there's quite a bit of work to do between today and Thursday, but I'm confident we can do it within the meeting times that we already have on the on the schedule. Um, so Phil, do you wanna you wanna take it from here? I'm sorry, Tony, are we talking about where we are currently? Yeah, the whole the whole list. Um, I would go top to bottom on the entire list to go through it with the board, make a final decision on which ones we're taking and which ones we are, you know, we're as a board don't feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, are we talking about the, Are we going to start from the stress test list or are we going, are we going from the, th from the five, four, four through the three at one? Okay. Yeah. All right, give me one quick second. Um, does everyone have the list or do I need to share, share the, the screen? I think it's best if you share it. We all have it but I think it's best if you share it. Okay. All right, can everyone see the screen? Yep. All right, so going from the top down so starting out with salaries and benefits, we have a- All right, Sorry, Phil, does, the, does this original list match what is on page three in the budget book, just to confirm? It should, right? There's no- Yeah, no, it should, but I don't okay. think that this list was, was in the budget book itself. Um, it but was it, in an abbreviated version. So I yes, 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 yes. That's, that's that is correct. Yep. Okay, that's what I made my notes on. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, first item up, reduction of one district-wide paraeducator to be determined. Are we going to vote on each item or do you want me to run? We don't have to vote. I think we went, you know, we went through it unless there's, I mean, the, unless there's, Unless there was an objection on it, we've we've kind of gone through it. Uh, if any of the board members would like additional discussion on that, raise your hand. Otherwise, let's just move on to the next. So we're saying that we're accepting this one. I like. I just need to be sure what because I know we want to vote to get a bit sense as to where yeah. we are, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is accepted. Okay. Yeah. Reduction of point two um, speech FTE to reduction of grade seven, including the math lab reduction at the middle school. I think this is the one where we had some questions on. Um, I, I will just start in terms of reduction in grade seven. And 
So I, I kind of, you know, took the opportunity this weekend and tried to slice and dice the data a thousand different ways. And I, and I looked at um, the student to teacher ratio in, in middle school. Um, and I'm just looking at classroom teachers. So I just want to make sure that my data is correct. On page 94 in the budget book where you have classroom teachers per school, um, this FTE would have been considered a classroom teacher. Um, I can speak to that. Um, it's pieces of classroom teachers. So basically uh, it's, it's really a repeat of what happened in sixth grade for this current year, where we used to have, well, a long time ago, we had 10 sections at each grade level. Then we've been down to nine sections for most of, well, for all of my tenure as, as middle school principal. And last year for the first time, we had a cohort come in that only had eight sections um, of, and so it really, when you look at the grades, the grade uh, seven, section reduction, we're going from what's currently nine sections of, um, of all of our core academic classes down to eight sections. So it's, um, I mean, it is a, there's a bigger conversation based on some of the um, questions about teacher retention and stuff, but it, it does affect staffing in all of the departments. Um, but when you combine it with our already reduced uh, sixth grade, there's a way to still keep um, the staff that we need whole, but we would actually be losing complete people. Okay, I just, going? yeah, I just, it, it takes your student to teacher ratio at a place that it's never been before. Um, you're actually at um, 25.3, so 25.3 students to one teacher. Um, and I just want to, I mean, you're the expert. So, you know, you, the highest you've been is, was back in 2014 at 24.8 students per teacher. So I just wanted to get comfort from you that yes, you're okay with this. This is the right decision moving forward. So Ruby, when you say that we're at those numbers, um, when I put in the staffing, it didn't, it, it keeps us within the 20 to 24 guidelines. We're at 23. So I'm not sure where, how you did your so I took the enrollment from page 50, mm -hmm. um, which is the Malone and McBroom historical, as well as the Malone and McBroom projection for this year. And then I looked, I compared it to the number of teachers on page 94. And it showed the historical classroom teachers for each building. So those hey, are the two Ruby? data. Yes. Ruby, look at page 82A. in the budget book because the class the the like a grade at the middle school because they get spread out to different classes specials and everything else throughout the day you need to look at the breakdown that dan has where it gives you the enrollment historical and projected and then with the estimated class sections for each subject yeah that's a, that's a better analysis to use for what you're trying to do, Ruby. But wouldn't the data match? Wouldn't the classroom teachers on a page 82, shouldn't they marry up to then the classroom teachers on page 94? Phil, I don't know if you can help me with that one. I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm almost wondering, do we, are we having a, a problem with one of our formulas inside the spreadsheet, which has happened to me sometimes? Um, there, yeah, there, whatever. Also, keep, in, keep in mind, project challenge is reported under SPED, not under the middle school, right? But classroom teachers on Correct. page 94 should match to core subject classroom teachers on page 82. No, that's what I'm saying. Like mock like project challenge is listed on page 94, but it's not on eight. No, that's specials. I'm just looking at total classroom teachers on the top. I'm not looking at total, total. I'm just looking at the top section, total classroom teachers that should match to total classroom teachers on 82.
Okay, so I, 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 I don't. It, it does. So I can tell you, Ruby. This is the way we when we do the budget um, for staffing. We we take the enrollment projection mm -hmm. and we determine how many um, how many sections we need, staying within the guidelines of twenty to twenty four at the middle school. And um, the way I worked it out in preparing the staffing budget uh, is the same. I've always done it, and we are not going over. Uh, 24. There's one exception. I, I believe the geometry class um, is the one class where we would go over. And we've done that in the past. And, and working with Janine Russo, the CIL, she says it's better in her mind to go over in that section, keeping the overall number of sections the same in math and having the smaller class size in, in the uh, grade level math class because the, the uh, accelerated students. I, yeah. Dana and, and Ruby, if there's a, a reconciliation issue between two pages, I suggest that we take that offline and someone reconcile sure. it. I guess the question on the table is, is this, you know, Dan, the implications of this, I mean, Ruby, you're basically saying, you know, what are the implications of this, of this cut, right? Yes, if I take his enrollment at 546, which is the projected of this year for the fiscal year of 22, and I divide it by the number of classroom teachers that he's now saying 21.6, I get a student to teacher ratio of 25.3. Okay, that's my math. I looked at that math for the last 10 years. And when I go back 10 years, 25.3 is the highest student to teacher that we've had. So my question is, are we comfortable with the high, this high of a student to teacher ratio? That's all my question is. So, so uh, uh, Phil, maybe if you and I want to look at it offline, um, I'm, I'm, we can do that. But okay. that's my thought process. Because I actually look at it grade by grade and it's broken out from the staffing document. I mean, the real, the real consequence though, Ruby, I think to the, to the bigger question maybe is what's the impact when we have a reduction I don't know. I, I haven't done the scheduling yet. So these are what I have are placeholders for actual teachers, depending on certifications, depending on uh, tenure and uh, all of those questions where we work with HR to determine who, who stays, who goes, who might get transferred to a different school. Um, it's a big thing with the, you know, obviously we often share teachers with the middle, with the high school, middle school and high school due to certification. But in some cases, I, I also have some K-6 certified. Yeah, I, what I might suggest, Ruby, I think let's get this written down and we as a team can come back to you because I think what's happening here is we don't fully staff by 1.0s. We break people up in all these decimals. And so I think that may be in our, what you're seeing. It might be best if we take the question, reconcile it, because uh, it's going to take, I think, mean, Ken, Phil, and Dan, maybe even Lisa to, to, to reconcile this. But let us do that, come back to you. ASAP, but I think the overarching question is um, with the staffing level, is Dan Doak and company comfortable with this for the delivery of instruction? We can do the reconcil reconciliation separately, but it may. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Bill. I, I think um, it's because we separate people in all of these point this, point that, point here that it's, it, it becomes very messy to try to understand, yeah. right? And right. to try to find efficiencies. So yeah. that's why I sliced it a different way. And yeah. I think it's worth, it's worth reviewing. And I can kind of show you what I did from all three buildings, the, the trajectory of how we've compensated for classroom teachers versus the increase and decrease in enrollment. Right. Yeah. What I would recommend, I think that gets into a, it's a great question. And districts all around us struggle with this because we all staff, and we actually do it for efficiency reasons. So I think it's a great question as we build towards the new budget under your new leadership team, meaning you're gonna have the same team, but a new leader. I think it's a, to me, that's a new team. It's a great question because it gets into the core of how we staff up and actually the drive to that breaking apart staffing is a move of efficiencies. And districts all around us do it. I'm not saying it's right, but we all do it actually to save resources. But it's maybe a good time for Weston to say, well, wait a minute, as you go to next year, is this as smart as it could be? But we can try and reconcile now. Let us come back to you with that answer. 
Uh, but I think it's a great future question uh, as you build towards uh, not this budget, because it, there's a lot of ins and outs here. That would be, you wouldn't be able to fix it now, even if you identified the problem. Yeah, no, Bill, I think that's one, one of the things that we have to definitely put on the list. The reason we spend so much time, I think, in lower school staffing, because it's an easy calculation. You take the projected enrollment divided by the class size um, guidelines and you come up with sections. And that's, you know, that's for the board easy to digest. When we get into the upper schools, it's very, it's very, it's very opaque. And it's not, not because it's, you know, deliberately opaque. It's just more com complex. The only thing I would say in closing is the easiest way is to look at the projected enrollment and divide that number by that grade by eight for sixth grade and seventh grade and by nine for um, eighth grade. And there you'll get a closer projection of our average class size for the core academics. And we'll true up the staffing to see what behind that, why your numbers are different, Ruby. Okay, let's move to the next. Next item was the reduction um, of the groundskeeper position. There was questions about that, Phil. What is, um, can you explain that one again? Because I, I had a few questions from board members. So last year, so just a quick history of this. So one of the, a few years ago when we had issues at, at Repson Field, um, we, did, we had a, an agreement with the board, Bill, and you can correct me if I say anything incorrect here, um, with the union to use to outsource the maintenance of um, pretty much all of our athletic fields. Um, this position was vacant for one year Last year, via an MOU with ASME, it was decided to add the position back. This year, during negotiation with ASME, um, we did have a discussion with ASME, and we did say, and we did agree that this position would, um, if filled, would only be a one-year um, position. So in terms of direct impact to the district, um, in terms of it will not have a severe or a significant impact to the district. Okay. A reduction at the high school of 1.2 um, FTEs, which tied into this is a 0.8 reduction or 0.8 reallocation of staff and two um, the alternative pathways. All right, unless someone interjects, I'm just gonna, I'm just assume that it's a yes and I'm just gonna keep going. Um, reduction, I don't, let me not say reduction a change in how instruction is delivered for K2 computer. Uh, I can continue to pause uh, K2 word language. Okay, stop there. Yeah, stop there. Okay. So I'm gonna start. Um, no one's saying anything. <laughs> So I am curious as to, and, and Ken, this is a question for you and Laura as well. And I, and, and I, um, I absolutely 100% agree with Taffy's passion behind including um, foreign language at that early age. I think it was, I think maybe Victor who proposed the question on, let's not talk about if we deliver, let's talk about how we deliver. Um, and so I wanted to understand from you if you've given any additional thought on if it's not a physical human being teaching foreign language, is there any um, technology that we can introduce into the children's day on a weekly basis? Um, I'm throwing this out there. If there's educational tools with, with Rosetta Stone or other sort of applications, I'm sure Dan can, can, can chime in too that we can uh, use to still introduce, you know, world language for K through two. Thanks for the question, Ruby. I did talk to Mercedes about that. Um, there are some, some tools out there, uh, as you suggest, uh, you know, would not be obviously as effective as, you know, in-person instruction. There is a cost. And so the cost benefit, you know, Mercedes was looking at that it, she, she really was not, not high on that approach. Um, she also looked to see, you know, if there were 
other options like like uh, you know some interest based ones for after school, but they really don't think they'd have an instructor for that. But I think you know technology uh, you know could be used, but um, you know I don't have her numbers offhand, but but she wasn't confident that it really would save us much. The other consideration is with this age group, um, keeping students engaged in, in the learning process is um, always better with, with an actual person. Um, in addition to that, the classroom teachers at this level, because they teach the same group of students all day and all the content areas already prep for six subject areas. In addition, and then in addition to that, of course, classroom community activities. So um, that's an additional workload on the teachers that I think, um, you know, would take a lot of, of planning and consideration before we decided to make that move. My position is that we really haven't had a thorough enough discussion on, on this for me to vote to remove it. I, I feel like we, we still have to go over the whole language program and curriculum. So um, I, I would not agree with this one at this point. We'll be prepared for that discussion in curriculum, Hillary. So we're, we're, we're getting ready for that. Okay. So, I mean, after that, maybe I'll feel different, but right now um, I'm not prepared to remove it. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I'm going to throw out a thought question here for everyone to think about. Um, so if, if, if not this, then what would you remove? So it's not for free, right? It's, it, it's, <laughs> Because at the end, we're going to have to basically have more work to do. So I think that um, it, it's going to be, you know, it's all well and good looking at efficiencies, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, this is one that was proposed by the administration. So, I mean, it's all well and good that we take a look at it, but it just, at the end of the day, we're going to ask those, uh, that same leadership team, to potentially replace that with something else, right? So, hey, Gina? Tony, just another, you know, like educational item to consider and maybe Laura, not to put you on the spot, but um, as we talk about reacclimating kids to full-time school day in, day out, and I don't necessarily like the term catch up, but a, a reevaluation and a re-leveling of, you know, what are the expectations of our children from an academic standpoint? Well, I am wholly in favor of having some sort of world language exposure, I recognize all the benefits to you as the expert in elementary education. Those few extra minutes a day, you get back to focus on core education. Is there value in that for next year? Well, there's always value to extra time for a content area. And that's what we've done this year with the time. Um, you know, an extra 10 minutes a day, the teachers do use uh, to great benefit. Um, and, and you're correct, Gina, when we bring our, all of our students back on a more regular basis next year and students who have not been with us this year, um, there will be a lot of individualized instruction and re-leveling and um, working with students to you know, identify gaps, you know, address those needs. Um, and at the, at the early elementary years, and this is true at West too, it's all the classroom teacher. Um, which is another reason I would not be in favor of, you know, another program or another way to deliver it. That would be the responsibility of the classroom teacher. So I think that this is a different, again, my problem sometimes when we present things with just a title, it can be a little misleading. Like we aren't cutting computer education. It's been reshuffled and there are adjustments. And while everybody on this board appreciates you know, world language at the lower level, I think we also have to recognize the benefit that our K to two students may have from having some, a little extra time on true basics for one year. Yeah, let me just process why Gina just to pick up on that. I wanna make sure the board has, and it's in the public record, we did the additional explanation. So the couple line explanation for this one written by Laura did get to that. And maybe that's where you're picking up, Gina. It did say very specifically reall reallocate that time to core academic classes in the coming year. So that's now in the public record. 
in the reduction explanation document dated January 20th that's been sent around and posted. We should get it posted with this meeting to supplement, complement this uh, line item chart. I, I mean, for me, we're talking about $34,000, but it's so much bigger and greater than that. And we really haven't gotten any argument um, cognitively, I guess you could say, against it. And so what I would say is, you know, and no one's going to like me saying it, but, you know, if we're part of a team, you know, we're working on 20%, there's a whole 80% that, that we don't talk about. And, you know, if that 80% is really on our team, I would like that 80% to not just weigh in, but, you know, put their, put their, you know, put part of that 3% on the line and, and come up with, you know, some contribution to this $34,000. I, I mean, I, I see no reason to remove it. I've seen no data to remove it. Um, just because they need more time for me, like, I think this is so much greater than that. So, you know, that's where I stand on it. Yeah. Um, Taffy's not, is Taffy on? Hold it for me. No, she had her staff meeting. Yeah. I mean, Taffy felt strongly about this. I, I think, um, let's, let's, let's skip this. Let's put a, I mean, we're going to come back to this, right? Let's just put an, let's just put a no on this for now. Because it's not Taffy was very vocal on this. It's not fair to even to to kind of vote without her on. So let's just put a no no, and we'll come back to this. Okay. Next items up um, are the stipends um, for the high school for athletics, and um, for some other pro um, extracurricular activities. Um, I guess this is a. Didn't we have an uh, in the various documents? Lisa said some of these she's found ways to either have volunteer advisor time, and maybe that's the wrong term to use, or combining them or whatever, so that while we may be cutting the stipend, like these clubs or some version of them are going to be able to continue. Right. Can I clarify? Is that okay? Yes, Thank you, Lisa. Please. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, I'm going to go through the list and I'm going to, um, there were a couple of, um, uh, misinformation on the list, and then we figured out a way to try to do it. Okay, it says Young Progressives Advisor. That um, was really only one position at 804. Um, it was Green Team Advisors is what that line should have said for 1608. You follow me? Then we have Academic Advisor, 804. Tutoring on Wheels, uh, Save the Children is 804. Those are all 804. St. Baldrick's advisor should have been just one at 804, okay? So now I'm gonna go back through the list of the ones that we are going to um, fund. We're going to fund the green team at the 1608. That club's been around a lot. And I think some of you heard about it at the policy meeting, all the great work that they do. I'm not that the other clubs don't, but, but that's a very um, popular active club. We're going to fund the academic uh, decathlon advisor because that involves competition um, on the weekends. And although they don't travel this year, they will, um, hopefully again. We're going to fund the St. Baldrick's advisor at 804. The ones that we are, that are going to continue, but they, we're going to um, postpone the funding for them a year is the Young Progressives, the Save the Children, and the tutoring on wheels. All those advisors know that and the clubs will continue. Now you might say, well, how are you paying for this? We have decided to um, take the aspiring scholars stipend um, and uh, not offer the aspiring scholars at the end of August anymore. You might recall that was the program that we um, had for incoming um, ninth graders. And um, we believe that um, one of the good things that actually I think it can come out of um, our COVID is that we can emphasize what all of the ninth graders, not just a select group need within our ninth grade academic team of teachers that really works on sending common messages regarding um, the, uh, the executive functioning skills, the working on Canvas and all of that. So with that funding, we propose to cover those other clubs, if I'm explaining myself clearly. Are there any questions? 
So Lisa, what does that mean? I mean, Phil, Lisa, what does that mean for the for the bottom line? I mean, we have a lot of ins and outs here, but what what does that mean for the bottom line? For the bottom line is um, it's there'll be no change. So it's just a matter of ins and outs, and we'll just have to clean up the overall stipend list. So there's no change um, with over so no impact. Yeah. And, and then let me that corrected corrections that Lisa just gave you is exactly in the January 20th document that I'm asking to get posted now with this meeting. I just sent it to Meredith last June to post. So what she told you lines up exactly with the document from the 20th that we sent to you and we'll get publicly posted. Um, if yeah, I can, can we maybe make, hey, Phil, can we maybe make a little asterisk reference that this list was amended in that document? Just because again, having a flow for the public to be able to follow when we have things changing in various documents, if somebody picks up one document, they're gonna look at it and think one thing, but it's not really what they're thinking. Yeah, I have to make a note on another, um, on, on another, on, on another, on something else. Awesome. Not really this one, but I'll make a note. Thank you. Um, with regards to athletics, I did ask Mark Berkowitz to um, leave one meeting and join in case there are any specific questions about those cuts, because quite frankly, he is the best person to provide the information if you have any questions. Lisa, on the ones that you're postponing, what does that mean? Does that mean that the clubs are continuing and yes. they're? The clubs are continuing. Generally, we this is this is how it works. Clubs have to be in existence for a minimum of three years before we fund them. Now, on top of that, so those three clubs, I think it'll be the fourth year. Um, we'll just fund it the fourth year. Now, uh, the stipend somewhat of clubs that we currently do, we review this constantly. How many kids are in the club? Is the club active? Does the club still sustain a stipend? So that process will still take place at the end of the year, but currently those um, clubs that I mentioned will continue. The stipend will not be there, however, and the people in charge of the clubs are fine with it. I spoke to each one individually. And the tutoring on wheels, I mean, that is, they go to Bridgeport, right? Is that correct? That's the one that they actually go to Norwalk. Miss Davido drives a van. Yes. Okay. Um, is, are there any like are there any other addition uh, like other ways to fund that so that because I know she spends a lot of time. No, there aren't, and and the time is spent in driving the students. There there are not um, a high number of students involved in that program. Um, you know, she takes the van. She got certified to drive it, and she drives down there. Quite frankly, this year it's been in abeyance because they can't, you know, drive. Right. So. All right. I have a bigger question, you know, on page uh, 123 in the budget book that, you know, uh, you know, Phil, I guess the question is we have, if you look at the entire stipend line, 878,000, which is, what we projected to uh, spend this year. You know, the question is, what are we actually going to be spending and whether there will be savings in that line? Uh, that's a big number. So, Bill, I'm not quite sure if you wanted us to have a general conversation, general discussion as it relates to stipend. And uh, We don't have to do it now, but I, I mean, that's a... Yeah, and Tony, we started this conversation in FinCom. Um, yeah. okay. And so we're far enough into the year now to start for Phil to be able to start gathering information back from the schools about what programs are running, are not running. Um, so that's on point to come back to us at least preliminarily in February, Phil? Uh, correct, but I, I think it just needs to have just an overall understanding that, you know, we're still, so school is in session, right? And there's still a lot of programs that are still going on. Um, there's there's a few stipends that have that have not been offered, but in general, for the for the for the vast majority, um, all stipends and all extracurricular are being offered. But at FinCom beginning um, next month, we'll we'll start to to compile lists of um, any projected savings. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And it may be important to note for all board members as the negotiating committee knows this, these stipends at some level are tied into the teacher's contract. And at each contract point, this is a discussion. So it's got a, a, several aspects to it. So work on it immediately, yes. I wanna reiterate what Phil said, cause he and I talked, there's still a lot of activity underway, but he will bring back to 
FinCom most immediately are their savings. I think the longer term issue here is wrapped up in your contract negotiations with the WTA. Yeah. Well, we have, you know, we, we do have an MOU that really does address stipends and, and, and COVID. So, you know, there, there could be some savings there. Okay. Um, so salary employee benefits just as has to do with all the ins and outs in terms of the adjustment for staffing um, as it relates to health benefits. Mm-hmm. Next category has to as property services, reduction to rubbish, repairs allowance, roof repairs, contracted services, paving and snow removal. Any discussion? Next category, other services, um, reduction in the spread allowance or contingency and the transition to e, um, to alternative pathways. I think the adjustment of the contingency amount for unanticipated sped tuition, um, I think that's one that we need to, carefully consider and and maybe that's one of those amounts that we put in at a higher number with the caveat that we will continue to to reevaluate as we progress through the spring um you know i or you know have a very concrete vote definitive decision by board of finance to support in case we go past that number um yeah, is particularly as we all know, um, COVID implications on the special ed realm um, are really unknown right now, and the impacts they may have going forward. Um, so I just I, I'm not comfortable with that full cut at this point. Yeah, I you know my recommendation is to leave it as is. We are scheduling to have a um, an executive session with the Board of Finance, um, and I think that at the Board of Finance, um, we have to be very um, explicit about the fact that um, what that number means, and that we if if the environment is such that we're going to basically. Um, overrun that number, we'll come back for more and get a commitment from them. Uh, I think this, my view is this has to be done in the con, you know, in, in conjunction with the Board of Finance, ultimately. Excuse me. Next set of reductions um, had to do with equipment. Um, just required muse, primarily music um, and some other um, various items here. So I'm not quite sure if you want to go out on each one or if everyone has the list, I'm not quite sure how we want to do with this one. Actually, can I go back, Tony? Are you, I just want to clarify, are you saying do not take the allowance reduction or and when you said keep it as is, what are we keeping as is? The original amount? Or, no, the, what's on the page there. So the suggested reduction yeah. keep it as is. Yeah. Is that just to clarify? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Phil. Okay. Um, so Tony, not good church. Should I just go down each item? Or I'll, I'll just. I, I would actually ask uh, if if there's any 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 item that um, board members want further clarification on or concerns with. Yeah, um, I'll ask uh, Dan. How many years now in a row have we denied the the music request for the middle school? Uh, I don't have that in my fingertips, but I can tell you that um, just generally every, every year they get feels like cut. a lot, right? Every year they get cut for some of what they offer, but 
um, and Ken Crom may be able to jump in. Sometimes they're able to purchase um, from funds from uh, a summer program that they've provided. Sometimes we've gone to PTO uh, or other philanthropy to get some of the items. So we've, we've mm -hmm. been able to supplement. Like I know that we've gotten cellos and stuff from our PTO in recent years. Um, it's just, it's a philosophical question. I think when you look at these uh, supplies, should we be budgeting uh, replacement and maintenance of our instruments as well as yeah. some of the other equipment? Right. When we look for places to cut, this has always been where we go. No, um, that's why I brought it up because it's, it, you know, it's, I think it's painful to see this kind of stuff on the, on the list. I mean, we, we value our arts program um, and, you know, in the middle school feeds into the high school program and you don't want uh, these children to not have the tools that are essential for their craft. Right. And remember many of the parents um, will rent or purchase their own instruments. It's the, it's the specialty instruments and the larger instruments that, um, that we keep on hand as well as, you know, obviously some for the teachers as well. Right. And uh, we, in talking with Liz and looking at the, um, the summer, we don't have much uh, left in those summer uh, performing arts funds that we've generated from the summer programs. Uh, we didn't run the program obviously last year, but we can get the uh, bass in the cello um, with that funding here. So uh, I have asked Liz to um, put together a five year um, suggested replacement plan that we can bring to either finance or curriculum if that's helpful to see the scope because it, you know, I mean, we have used this summer account to help at times, uh, probably more so than we have had items in the budget. So, um, you know, and, and obviously we do support our arts program. Uh, you know, Liz assures me we can run our programs next year. Um, and we, we will get that, we'll get that bass and cello in another, in another way. So okay. on this list for the middle school and the high school, like, I guess one question is what's sort of, we'll call it tier one and tier two. And then the next is what are, what can you cover? Or, or what will not get covered that is of a, you know, tier two? Is that an answerable question? Yes. So are you referring to music or, or this whole list? This um, whole list. This whole list, we, we, we have not tiered these items. We have paused, uh, you know, and, and held off on all, all new equipment. The project lead the way, I think as I mentioned last time at the middle school, where um, we actually started a discussion about whether or not, um, you know, either reaffirming, reaffirming the project lead the way itself, or maybe doing that program in-house given some of the uh, the recurring costs that Project Lead the Way has versus having our own in-house uh, created program, which obviously we always put our own twist on a program, um, but we certainly are able to deliver the Project Lead the Way program as we have uh, this year. Um, you know, so, but we have not, we have not taken this full list and tiered it. It's something we could, could do. Um, but that, you know, one of the biggest items here is the recurring replacement of those robotics kits for Project Lead the Way. Um, I don't know if you want, I can speak to how we're trying to fund the items at the high school, if that's helpful. That's helpful. Okay, so starting with the high school CPR training mannequins, we are going to purchase them this year, um, is my understanding. The cello, that's, we don't know what we're gonna do about the cello. Um, I do have some ideas about that. Um, in the past, we have uh, sent out emails to the community about, you know, the school community. Does anyone have an instrument that they don't use anymore? We got a trumpet the other day based on that. But right now, we um, will have to work with Liz on that. With the, um, the IMAX for the um, photography program, we approached the PTO. They're going to be discussing that on Friday. With the survey equipment for... Um, the civil engineering program. We're going to purchase that this year. We're going to purchase the new sensors this year. Um, we went through the budget to see, um, 
you know, what we currently have, everything else, if we could do that. And then the upgraded kit, we are asking the PTO if they would purchase half of them for next year, because what we really need is we need both. We need the full amount for the following year because of the change in the curriculum. But Erin Lucia um, went through and found ways to, it's called a kit. She went through and painstakingly found what we need specifically in the equipment without buying an entire kit, but buying just the, the necessary parts, which is actually um, less expensive. And we hope if the PTO would fund the humanities request with the IMAX and then the VEX kit, we would be in good shape, but um, we're gonna have to wait. We probably won't know that for another month. That's very helpful, thank you. One sec. Other objects uh, for 2,500, this is an 8,100. Um, and this is just a transfer of expenditure of 81,000 from our operating account to the, um, to the open choice grant. This is the list that we had um, to get us to the 381. Um, so we're still at 381. The next set of, next section here has to do with a list uh, of- tell. Phil, sorry to interrupt. That's when I was a little bit confused on the open choice grants. It's it's a grant, but we're spending it, but it's a reduction. I, right. I, don't, I don't follow the. No, that, that's okay, Victor. I, I wanted just to have a, just a general public discussion um, as to the use of the open choice grant, um, just for our purposes, just so we make a decision or the board should make a decision as to how they want to use this funds. Um, so that's why it's listed here as a reduction. Um, so I'm proposing that we shift a section either um, at, I think at grade three section um, to the open choice grant. So once we go to the next round before we get to the board of finance, or I'm sorry, board of selectmen, we would, we would reduce a section or the expenditure for one section at grade three and just offset that with a grant and remove those two lines from our operating budget. So it's really just an offset, Victor. So that's why it shares a reduction. We're gonna we just we're gonna reduce something by this eighty one thousand. Then it will be gone from from this discussion. Hmm. Not sure I followed, but I trust you. <laughs> so last week we we went ahead and we had discussion as to um, additional reductions. Um, we did our stress test. In addition to the stress test, we found some items that we are pretty confident that we'll be able to, our, we have consensus on one, and we have some other items that we, we are proposing to further reduce. Um, the board did discuss um, a few weeks ago when we started the shift in, shift in um, from purchasing our, our compute, the replacement equipment, the laptops, um, to a leasing option that will save us uh, $221,000 Excuse me. Um, in addition to that, we did discuss not funding uh, the internal services account from the operating account for dental claims for another year. Legal fees were and and, and and so on, on that one for the record, I, I I'm not aligned with with that one. Can can we talk about that a little bit? Rather than move on, is that okay, Tony? You're muted. <laughs> yes, we should talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So I think that, you know, I would agree with Victor. I'm not comfortable doing that yet. And I, I wonder if maybe, I guess, Phil, you could go into a little bit of your rationale of why you're willing to draw down just, uh, well, you're willing to draw down for the dental claims on that right now. Well, well, really, so primarily, or let, let's start out with, with why we would need to do that. So one of the reasons, or the main reason why we would need to do that is, is to get us to a budget that's, you know, that's 
that's a reduction and we're not adding to the to, to the budget. So we all know that what if you once you once you take a recurrent expense from a non recurrent um, revenue line item at some point that re that expenditure will need to be funded by some source for the past uh, two years we have um, not fund the internal services account to deal with uh, to cover our claims. Um, for right now, in all indications, we will not be shifting um, away from the state partnership fund. Um, so there's not, not necessarily a need for us to continue to build up a, a reserve unless unless um, situation may change drastically for us to do that. Um, based on discussion with Brown and Brown, there is not that indication that we will be shifting away from the internal services, I'm sorry, from the state partnership fund. So in terms of a reserve and where we would be in terms of um, end in balances, we will end this fiscal year if the trend continues. From a budget perspective, the budget is to end the year with approximately $760,000. Um, based on current trend, we are thinking that we will end the year closer to the 790 range. Um, so, in, and if we draw on that, we will still have money left in the reserve of over $300,000. So I'm fairly comfortable with, with making this move for one year. However, um, similar to the, um, the contingency that we have for the SPED, we do need to make a decision because we have to be aware that when, if we should expend all that money from the reserve account, at some point when that happens, it will be, or if we should no longer decide to fund, no longer decide to draw down on the reserve account, that it will be an automatic increase. For example, for this year, if we don't fund, it will be an automatic increase of roughly 0.8%. So just so I understand, so basically what you're saying is that with our medical plan, we really don't have the option to self-insure anymore if we do that. Is that correct? Our current plan is with the state. That that option is always there. However, um, based on contract, it would have to, we would have to reopen, there would have to be a reopener, so to speak, and we would have to have a discussion with the unit. And it would have to be a significant burden uh, to the district for us to make that shift based on contract language. Okay and provide a benefit to the employees. Uh, last year, we had looked at the reopener issue and it was a, it was a non-starter on two fronts. One was economically, would it lead to enough to have the union agree? The union has to agree to reopen or they can just say, thank you, no. And the other is obviously in the context of COVID-19, whether it made sense to be shifting around on healthcare. Uh, so I, I would suggest those two issues are still front and center. Um, yeah. but Phil is doing some of the digging on that larger larger question. Yeah, I, the way the way I come out of this is that if we that's a reserve, that's 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 a reserve that's ultimately the um, the town's the town's money. Right. Um, if we don't if we really don't need it. Right. Um, it should basically be given back to the town and ultimately go to reducing the mill rate. Right. Um, I, I mean, it's it's as simple as that. And Phil basically, you know, needs to recommend how much, if there's any, ultimately how much we need to keep in there. But if we're if there's really no chance we're going back to the, you know, to a um, to a self-insured model for health insurance and the dental insurance, even though it's self-insured, it's it's pretty stable from what I hear from Phil, then. I don't see us needing that level, and I would basically propose to use it to um, to go against the the budget. I mean, it, it's a very. I mean, for me, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty simple decision if there's little financial risk from doing it. Yeah, and thank you, Tony. And I, I would I would add to that. Um, you know, I appreciate from a short-term perspective why we're thinking about it, but but let's think it. Let's just play this out two years, right? In two years, if we keep on on the same path, you're stuck with it in the third year, having to fund it and and use the, using up the funds, right? So you're you're back to where you started at very shortly. Uh, on all of these, we're going to be <laughs> yes, one way or another. We're we're you know for a variety of reasons regardless of what reserve levels we use, we're back to where we started. And that really gets to a bigger question, which is 
let's, you know, even if we take this, let's not, let's still have the discussion of the fact that this doesn't, this is not meant to um, gloss over bigger issues of other efficiencies that we can get, right? Because sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that taking from cap, you know, taking from the capital is actually an efficiency move. It's not, right? And so this is to be perfectly transparent. This is a financial engineering move that we can take, but it doesn't really help us with the discussion around efficiency, right? So I'm going to be very clear around that. So Victor, if you're kind of saying, you know, you know, this is this is this, you know, it's a game we're playing here by by taking reserves. I'd say it's it's a financial engineering move, but I don't think it takes away from the bigger discussion, right? Based on that discussion, I'm going to assume. I'm sorry, one more question about that. So you'll say you'll still have three hundred thousand dollars. Is that enough to then fund the Delta Dental? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just to clarify, Hillary. So we will end this current fiscal year with right, close with seven hundred. When we draw another year, where we draw for twenty two, we'll have three hundred plus. Um, so at that point, when we enter or when we start discussion for FY twenty three. A decision is going to have to be made at that point as to what we will do, because okay. at that point we will only have enough funds to fund for one more year. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think for that reason, I, you know, we've got a we've got a couple things that we have on hold that we're looking at to see the budgetary impact. I mean, I I'm reluctant to take all of this this year when we know what that's going to mean for us next year and the following year, and I wonder if there's a way to to spread that out over the next few years. And the corollary with that would be to develop in our multi-year budgeting a way to fund our dental. Um, we'll have to budget for that. And then also to you know, consider a plan, even if it's a contingency plan for funding the internal services fund so that we have the flexibility to switch to a self-funded healthcare plan when that becomes the economically smart thing for us to do as a district. I understand that our consultants are telling us right now that that's not the right move, but that doesn't mean uh, that, it, that it won't be uh, in our best interest to change down the road because I'm hearing that the, somebody told us, I think it was you Phil, that the, that the, the state plan is a little bit underwater or in some kind of trouble itself. So, I mean, while we're going through this exercise of multi-year budgeting, these are the very types of things that we should have on our horizon because an underwater state health plan means that we, we may have to consider options sooner rather than later and we won't have the internal services fund to help us. Um, yeah, I, I don't think personally, I don't know how you feel, Phil, but I think we'd probably be going to a private, not a state plan, but a private plan rather than a self-insured high deductible plan, right? Correct. I think once you're with a, a private plan, you have a, some a sort of kind of predictability. There's a lot of volatility that's involved or in just in our with a self-insured plan. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why we shifted to the state partnership plan. Because while you may have a few years where things are sort of kind of level, you will have those years where, where claims just spike. And it, it, just, it happens regardless of what are, just historically, in every in every five year cycle, give or take, you will have you will have high claims. So just to give you guys a sense, in addition to just funding um, dental claims, there's the administration cost. There's also the stop loss, um, the stop loss insurance policy as well, which you will have to fund. Um, what is the stop we, loss? I'm sorry. What is your stop loss? Like what would what is it? So the stop loss, pretty much what, what that says is that the board will only pay up to a certain dollar amount. After that, as the stop loss insurance will cover that. What is that dollar amount? Uh, I would have to double check to see what a dollar amount was. Okay. Um, but just, to, just, just so you guys um, know, when we were self-insured, our stop loss insurance pretty much was um, went up to over a million dollars by itself. And um, that kind of one of the reasons why we said at that point it was too expensive to continue um, with the self-insurance plan. So I think, in, as, as Tony mentioned, what we would look at is a combination of a self-insured, um, of a private plan 
with a hybrid plan with, with some components of a self-funded plan, meaning like an HSA plan or something similar, um, if it's economically more viable to do that. Now, now, just, just as, as, as Melissa mentioned, so we ultimately what we decide to do um, in terms of how much of a draw, how much we fund or do not fund the dental claims really is a, is, is, is a, is a board decision. It all depends on ultimately where we end up because there'll be a lot of ups and downs as we continue the process and we may be able to tweak this number somewhat. I, you know, I think practically speaking, we're going to have to come back to that one and, and take, we're going to take, we're going to have to take some, we're gonna, I mean, I, Phil, I would put, let's go back to it. I would put yes now, but with the caveat that we go back to that, because I, I'm, I'm just trying to be very practical at the moment. And then if everyone's really uncomfortable, we'll go back to that and adjust it. Okay. Um, Phil, what you do not have here is you have the leasing option of equipment replacement, but the addition to the EREP line is going to is going to uh, erase that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sorry, but I stopped because um, there was discussion of um, the ISF. Okay. Okay, great. So these are all the items that we discuss. Um, the software adjustment, um, the reduction for additional for the 0.3 library para, um, and also the FT the 0.3 FTE adjustment at the high school. Also discussed was a reduction or uh, the increase to our ERIP of two hundred roughly two hundred and two thousand dollars. So where we are right now, if we so these are all the known these are all the items that we technically agreed on or the board agreed on. Um, we are at two eight one. We had additional items on this list. I think those we re rejected outright unless anyone feels like it's worth any discussion. No, I thought the number, the, the twos were gonna be rejected also. Yeah. All right, so with that said, um, we are at 281. Hey, Phil. Yes. Just a clarifying question. Um, if you scroll up, you have a reduction to our expenses of 81,000 for the open choice grant. But yes. we also, I believe, have the 81,000 counted as other revenue. So walk me through, or is that a different 81,000? No, it's the same 81. So this is, I'm sorry, Gina. So this list that we have, is pretty much how we came down to the 544. So that's why it's here. So these are just a list then of all those assumptions that we made or reductions that we made to get us to the 381. So that's why it's listed also as revenue. So it's, it's the same item. But then are we double counting it? Because if we have the revenue reduction of 81,000 already in the budget, and then now you're saying we're gonna have an $81,000 of expense of, of expense reduction, isn't that two reductions? No, it's it's really it's really one. Um, it's it's the same. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. No, I'm because saying, like I I mean, you, you have the entire budget that's presented on pages twenty two through twenty six or whatever, and those right. are all of our expenses. And then the last section are all of our revenues. Correct. And that eighty one thousand dollar reduction is in that is in that number to get us to the three eight. Which is correct, but if, if you if you think about your expenses, if you think that it once this line gets removed, there was also will be an equivalent expenditure for eighty one thousand, which will be removed for our up from our operating budget. So our operating so expenses will be reduced and the revenues will be reduced. But you you're tying the expense to a third grade section, correct? That's my recommendation, just because we have an increase there, but that, that reduction can be anywhere in the budget. That, can, can we just, because I agree with uh, both Victor and Gina on this, this one line item, it's, it's very confusing how you're listing it here. Can we mm -hmm. just keep this list pure to 
reductions only, because in the end, to Gina's point, it's a grant. So well, it's, it's revenue. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's got to be both. It's got to be, it's got to be the end, the, the, this is the net. So you have to list the ins and the outs. Then list it as the third grade section and not an open choice grant expenditure. Um, okay, we, we could we could do that. Um, that that's fine. But it, it, it accomplishes in terms of where we'll end up. It's the same thing. It's just a matter of how it's worded. Yeah. Because it's really an in and an out. Because yeah, I would I would I would then try to maybe clarify it in the side as basically how the net um, how the net gets calculated. All right, so another way to look at it, right now we have $81,000 of, of expenses somewhere within the budget. We're, we're gonna say, okay, to, we're gonna, the, the revenue grant, and this was only for discussion purposes. Another way that I could have done this was just not to include the third grade or any, an, an equivalent $81,000 and just offset it with the grant and not have this, not have this discussion. I purposely included it here um, for full transparency, to have a discussion to see how we will be allocating expenditures to the open choice grant. Uh, let, let me just underscore what Phil's trying to do here, because we've applied it across costs in the past, and Phil, and doing what he just said, um, it, it's probably worth a little more discussion. Because the flip side of this is, you don't want to have open choice solely tied to that, and if suddenly you can't do that, they, you know. But I hope you get the spirit of what Phil's trying to do. So maybe as the board's asking Phil that this is important to do, but in a separate context than in this budget process. Uh, but I, I hope you all hear the spirit of what Phil's trying to do here. Yeah, but I'd like to keep this list as, as pure as possible. So for example, on my list to discuss today is a section between K through five. So if that in turn ends up truly happening, it should just be listed on this list in its pure form as an additional section to reduce the budget. Correct, correct. So, but for right now, let's not make any adjustments to this 81,000. Well, let's just see, cause it's already factored in. Yeah. Once we get to other discussion in terms of other reductions, then we can play with this $81,000. Yeah. I mean, it's Phil, you could, you could spend that 81,000 in a variety of ways. You've just decided to actually line item it in the way you did. Correct. Right, okay. Um, I know that Taffy's here. Welcome, Taffy. Um, uh, Tony, did we want to go back up to um, language, for Spanish for K through two, just to um, confirm what we're doing here? I know we put in, it was tentative. Yes, Taffy, I, I, you weren't here. The rest of the board was, was about to really get, you know, get rid of uh, K2 language. And I, I said, well, wait a minute. No, uh, we weren't. No. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, no, we were not. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Um, I'm only kidding. Go ahead. Uh, uh, please tell me it was the opposite. Uh, you know how uh, I feel. I don't need to reiterate it. Where do you guys want to go? I think we kind of decided we'd, we'd let the curriculum committee hear the re report, um, you know, through the curriculum committee and then, and then circle back on it. So we, we put it we've in already a, done it. So we've had the discussion uh, with the curriculum and there is pretty much um, I mean, we don't need to vote in curriculum. There was a very, very strong argument for keeping this in and not touching it. So if you want to go ahead and take that off the list, Bill, um, I think we're good at curriculum. If you are all good here. Yeah, take it off. The, meaning yeah. take the cut off the list. Take the cut off the list. We don't need to go back to curriculum to discuss this. We've, we, we, I mean, we'll okay. be having the same discussion as we had last time. So I don't think, I think it's a waste of time. Let's be efficient. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And can I just add one thing to this? Um, is I think, because now this is the second year in a row that this has been on the chopping block. I think we need as a district to make a commitment that. It will not continually be on the chopping block and that we are committed yeah. to infusing Spanish or world language in the K through two area. It's just a, yeah. a com the conversations just need to morph around how we're delivering it. Not if that's we're what we discussed. It. Yep. Okay. We did so, discuss that last time. Um, so that will come back to curriculum. 
that discussion of how okay. we deliver it as opposed to if we deliver it, we'll come back to curriculum. Right. I'm just throwing out the challenge for future that it should not, we should not still be seeing it on a yearly basis. Correct. Thank you, Ruby, for reiterating that. Uh, and sorry, with, with I, that, sorry, I joined late, everybody. Yeah, with, with that, um, I just want to take a minute to, to just a, a sanity check on where we are, right? So we started with 381. We went through the reductions that gets us to what? Where are we now? Uh, We're at Bill. 281, I think. Yeah, we're at we're at, we're at two eight eight. The I didn't word language back gave us some um, additional increase by 0.06. Yeah. Okay, and out, and out of that two eight eight, or the delta between two eight eight and three eight one, how much of the, of that is the internal reserve fund? Uh, 0.78. But that also that, I think that, only having one fifty for special ed which yeah. is, a, I think, a concern. Yeah, we have 150 for special ed. Which, which Tracy was not, Tracy was not mm -hmm. totally comfortable with, right? Yeah. So well, I think we have to move back to some of the other bigger, bigger yeah. budget items. I mean, this list, and this has been a helpful list and it's been good to go through it, but yeah, I think it's time I, to go back to the book. Yeah, I think it's, it's, um, I think we're, we're, I think this is where we are. Um, and I think there, well, maybe uh, like to hear from the board members before we go further in terms of what they're thinking is, where we should be, what their feeling is in terms of where we should be heading. Um, also I'd like to hear from the leadership team as well. Um, but maybe if I could start with some of the other board members in terms of what their view is on where we should be heading next the view on the number and where we should be heading next. I, I don't want, I feel like the numbers are relevant. I, I, Cause again, I don't- Well, Ruby, it is. Yes, I, I think it is. But the number does indicate the work that we did to get here does indicate what we've, what we've addressed and what we haven't addressed, right? I, I, that's I what I, that's what I meant. Good, because I, I, I want to be clear. We, we do a budget every year, not, for cost cutting purposes, businesses, nonprofit, profit, whatever, they do a budget every year so that the board can understand how the leaders are thinking about their business, yeah. right? And so when we go through each section, we understand how the leadership team wants to run their particular business. It's not just an, a, a, like constantly, where are you cutting here? Where are you cutting there? Where are you cutting there? So yeah, I agree with you. Now let's go into uh, you know, some, some discussions in other areas. Want to start? Um, I can start. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, I think I think we're going to have to look at some some bigger issues here. I think that this is a this is an important year for us to get the budget as low as possible. Not just because it's in the best interest of the town and 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 the schools, but because it sets us on a path for the future for having. Um, a low baseline budget that when times might be more positive or we have a strategic plan from the district that causes us to reevaluate some method of de delivering education or some innovative educational measure that we want to adopt that we have the framework and the ability to do it so i think it's i think it's really incumbent upon us to get the budget as low as possible um, i spent a lot of time this weekend looking at um, enrollment and our um, predicted enrollments from past years, our current enrollments and past enrollments and our staffing. And, you know, I, I see large decreases in enrollment from the past 10 years and I see virtually no um, decrease in, uh, in staffing. I see a, a large percentage wise, a large decrease in clerical staffing. I see that that's something that we've reduced, but in terms of, of, um, 
administrative staffing has actually increased and the teacher certified staffing has um, stayed relatively the same or increased slightly at times. Para, the para staffing has also increased over the past 10 years. So, um, you know, those numbers are what they are and that's what we have right now in our district. But I think that this is an opportunity for us. And one of the questions posed was, you know, our hiring strategy, our retention strategy, all these things that, um, you know, and I, and I was a little disappointed in the, in the answers that we received in the, in the budget Q and A uh, document. I don't feel that there's a real um, hiring strategy that kind of speaks to the Weston excellence. Um, I think we have an excellent teaching staff and an excellent um, staff in general here in Weston, but we want to embrace that excellence and continue to require that excellence through all steps of the hiring process, retention process, and make sure that we're making smart choices about our staffing. Um, and I think we have some hard decisions to, to make um, in the present, but I think we really need to set ourselves on a path. You know, what are the needs of the lower schools versus the upper schools in terms of what type of um, hiring decisions we're making? Are we looking at, um, how much seniority is valued in, in, in these types of positions? What are, you know, how, how are we exploring tenure and, and those types of decisions? So, you know, I, I think we need to look right now at, um, at staffing, unfortunately. Well, I would say, Melissa, I mean, you're, you're right. Like, if you look at net teachers, like people can think that we haven't reduced. But I think when you get down into the details, you will see, I mean, I only went back about eight years, but um, a lot of the increases we're seeing that's causing like not necessarily a huge adjustment on the total line, but yes, our teaching staff, like regular classroom teachers have been relatively flat, but we've had drastic increases in academic support, student support, paras. So I think as the evolution of servicing our students in-house, we've hired more people to accommodate those needs. So I think we've got to be careful just things staffing as like teachers. We have to break it down into the various components and really look at how we're at the evolution of the services provided by this district to its students and how we've staffed accordingly in order to reach that point. I, I think that's right. That's exactly right. We, you know, this is these, what we have is what we have now. I think what we have, what I'm, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we need to be really thoughtful right now. We're at a point where we can set goals and, and have a, a strategy going forward so that we're not finding ourselves in this, in this position. But I do think at a, at a minimum for this year, it would be fiscally irresponsible to, to increase any, any section size. So I don't know. I know there was, a, a first grade discussion that we had a few months back, but I mean, in looking at, not a few months, a few meetings back, um, in looking at the enrollment projections long-term, you know, I, I, I don't feel like it's responsible to, to hire additional teachers right now when we know that the enrollment has historically and most likely will continue to be going down. There may be a blip associated with COVID in terms of a, a short-term you know, people moving in for a year or two, but in looking at the projected enrollments, we have, we may have a blip in a couple of years, but we'll also have a decrease in other years. And I think that gives us the opportunity with teacher certifications to, to move teachers around to cover, maybe there's a grade where they're, where we're above guidelines for a year or two, or, you know, that's fine. Or maybe there's a teacher that a grade that is, you know, that does not have as high of an enrollment in that but, particular year that that teacher can bump down to another. What, I just, Melissa, you know. One second, uh, one second, let, uh, one second, Lisa, you raised, Lisa, Lisa, raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I just want to speak to this, to the certified staffing and, and please other principals, if you want to want to join in, I think that um, I would just caution you that especially at the six twelve level, when you start reducing um, making changes in staffing, reducing staffing. The idea of tenure certification, where these people go 
can really have um, a very challenging adverse impact on the school. And I can give you an example. You can have someone that's certified, for example, in math 712, that all of a sudden has to come to the high school and is going to bump someone out that teaches calculus and has never taught calculus before, despite having worked for 10 or 15 years. Those are the kinds of things that will really adversely impact the quality of the instruction at the high school level. A science person that technically can teach science, there's someone that, at the middle school I know that can do it, that can teach chemistry. There is no way that the quality will be the same if that person comes up and teaches chemistry because although being certified has never taught it. I'm a perfect example. The district years ago told me, if you wanna stay in Weston, I was told by the superintendent, you must get certified in French. My French is abysmal, but I'm certified to teach it and I would never go in and teach a French four. So, I, I mean, I get it that we have to look at staffing, but the unintended consequences are what I would say severe when you start looking at it. Because as much as you try to keep the people from, from the, you know, the actual person, you have to look at the person. And then you get questions like, how can this person who taught at middle school for years is now teaching my kid physics? It's a good question. I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything. I, will, I would just chime in. Let me just respond real quick to that point, Lisa, because I just want to be clear in my comments. Um, and then I do want to hear what, what you have to say about it, Dan. Um, I think what I'm, what I'm saying and what I'm, I'm bringing this up for discussion is for, for these very reasons. Is mm -hmm. I don't think that this type of strategy is clear to the board. Mm -hmm. And I think when you see declining enrollment, but yet you know, head count saying the same or increasing, I think it makes us wonder why. So this, these are the very types of discussions yeah. we need to have. And I think that this is the type of strategy we need to have in place so that we can understand going forward what the impacts are. I would say my, my position would be to keep, I'm not looking for reductions right now. I, I was coming at it more from no increase and also a very strategic look going forward so that every hire, every retention that we understand the district-wide impact so that we can make sure that we continue to have excellence in Weston. People applying for positions, people retaining positions should know and be proud of what we have here because we have a theory behind it. We, we know what we're looking for, we know what we wanna cultivate and we know what we wanna sustain and support. That was where I was coming from. Well, I'm sorry if I seem defensive. It's just, um, and I welcome that conversation because I really think that we have to have it. You know, we faced a problem um, a few years ago where we did not know who was going to teach AP Econ. I'll be very frank. And I went through every single transcript that people, you know, every single transcript of every certified social studies teacher. And lo and behold, Mr. Mater, who's probably one of the, you know, most engaging teachers in the school, beloved by the students, had a degree in econ and we were able to train him. So I, I agree um, because there are, this could, if we don't do this, it will, it could really erode the, um, the teaching and learning in the district. I was just gonna add on to what Lisa said and say, you know, we actually meet the, the administrators in this district when it gets time for the actual scheduling. Right now we're just budgeting positions, but when it gets down to people, we don't have all that information right now. We don't know exactly who's going to retire at this point uh, or who, who might move or who might be on maternity leave. But we look at the level of specificity that Lisa mentioned to make sure that we have the right people teaching the right subjects at the right grade level. And it isn't just because they're certified. And that's the scary thing, you know, in, in the age of declining enrollments and staffing and being responsible with the resources that the residents of Weston provide to us, we do have to, um, you know, be judicious. I guess, you know, Ken Craw and I worked together, I think it was just last year, about a staff modeling plan for the middle school uh, to make sure that we could retain our, um, you know, our highly valued staff uh, and move to a model where eventually maybe each teacher is teaching four in each of their content areas, plus doing an additional resource enrichment. That's an expensive model. And, and we would need the discussion, the direction from the board, if that's the direction you want us to move in, rather than this, this cohort had eight sections at WIS, they need to have eight sections at, um, at the middle school. 
know, that's, there's two very different philosophies. And I guess that's, that's what we look to you all for the direction. Can I respond to just um, where this conversation is going and my position on it? It is that I looked at the multi-year budget and it made me very sad because we really can't afford that. And that's, that's what I thought, my like visceral reaction when I looked at it. And I would say the same thing here. You know, in this town, the people, our constituents are struggling. They're small business owners. Every, I know more people that have, you know, taken a pay cut or lost a job than that have gotten an increase. And so where I would go with it, and, and I'm sorry, is that, you know, we've got to be able to, you know, have, have the teachers and have the staff share some of this burden in some way. And whether that is, you know, changing the way that the health insurance, um, you know, is, is, is structured or, um, you know, in some other, you know, financial way, because it's, it's hard for me to look at, at the staff getting a 3% increase when I don't know anyone that's gotten a 3% increase. So, and when I look at it and I see that such a large population is at such a high compensation rate, which, you know, because they've been so dedicated, but they're still there. So that's where, you know, I struggle when I look at those at those statistics. I think we have to be careful with the multi-year budget because in my mind, that multi-year budget that was presented to us um, last week, that's only 20% completed. Like that multi-year budget has to evolve and we can have a conversation. I don't want to have it now about the multi-year budget. We can have it at the end of this discussion. But I think, I, I, I think though, back to Melissa's point though, it's, it's twofold, right? It's, it's, it's the strategy on hiring um, staff going forward and then, and then how we're positioned today. They're two very different conversations. Um, I, I wanna focus just in terms of finding efficiencies on how we are staffed today. Um, and if it's okay, I'm just gonna go straight to K through five. Um, and talk about that. And, I, and I'm not going to look by school because honestly, Laura, Patty, you guys are the experts. Uh, who am I to, to judge whether or not we need, you know, X number, you know, of sections in the first grade versus third grade. I just wanted to look holistically of K through five. And when I look at elementary or what's regarded to be elementary nationally is K through five is our enrollment since 2014 has declined by 11%, right? It's the, it's the one section that has the most volatility, it has the most migration, et cetera. Every single year, year after year, we have decreased K through five. We started at 1,000 students in kindergarten and we're ending at 888 for this year. Next year, we are projected to lift by 2%. We are projected to increase by, by, what is it, 22 students. That's a hard pill to swallow for me, especially because we have declined every single year, year after year. Um, I pulled up other enrollments. Westport, they're projecting a, a down 1% in enrollment. New Canaan, they're projecting down 2% in enrollment. So I think this is where we, we have to talk about we need to figure out enrollment. We need to stay status quo in between you, you, the, the buildings. I mean, I, I'm assuming the teachers are certified K through five. You have to figure out what is the most efficient way to operate with current teachers. I also will bring up because it, it, you guys, I can share my document with you. When I slice the data a different way, this student to teacher ratio that I keep talking about we are at the lowest that we've been. We are at, if you take the number of students divided by the number of classroom teachers, we are at 20.7 projected for next fiscal year. We were at 21.3 back in 2014. So again, there is room for some efficiency there. But again, I would leave it up to you to figure, to, to to move and groove around, but I, I, I do not think we should be adding an additional section in the K through five view. So Ruby, you're right. We, uh, we hire, you know, every year we, obviously our teachers have to be hired certified K six. 
um, K-5, K-6. We look really closely at, we share, Laura and I, we, after we finally get our enrollment numbers and we move teachers between buildings, you know, um, every year. I mean, or almost every year. So we are really efficient that way. Our numbers are built purely on what is projected for us to have. So last year, I went down one section in third grade because I didn't have eight, you know, so um, projected, I'm going to project to go down one section in fourth grade next year because my numbers, I still, according to the projection, I'm at 22.6, almost 23 in every classroom in fifth grade, 22.1 in fourth grade. And then the question, I guess, is the, is the third grade. Um, and because so many students went out for the homeschooling, I think that that's really where the question is. Um, so, I mean, our, our, really our staffing is purely based on enrollment numbers. No, I, I, I hear you, but I, I think that be, because it's the, it's the first grade and third grade conversation, mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll say it out loud, I, I do not agree with Malone and McBroom, McBroom's, Malone and McBroom's projection for next year. I think it is inflated. So therefore my personal recommendation is that we stick with, uh, I think those two grades, 43 sections versus the proposed 44. You know, this and year it is up to back. and it is yeah. up to the two. It's up to you guys to figure out based on enrollment how that shakes out by grade. And so then, what happens if it turns out since those unusual spikes we're seeing this year do include they are projections of homeschooling students coming back in, potentially students who left to go to private school coming back in? I fully agree. I mean, we're we're in a unique year, um, but what happens if you have the return of those students back into our district and we do meet that projection? Plus 2%. And on that note, and on that note can we not get some of that data? Like uh, Patty and Laura, can you call parents who have elected to go homeschooling and say, what are your plans? I mean, so we don't have to guess, right? Right, we've already been doing that. I have a survey out yeah. to, um, the current students. And for example, uh, we don't have all the responses yet, but I already know of 11 incoming first graders for next year based on that survey. Yeah, they're coming, they're coming back. Right? They are. We, in the Q&A, we, since the last meeting, I talked to Mike Zuba. I went back, look at page four in the posted Q&A, question number seven. I mean, you as a board will have to decide, but we have gone in and reanalyzed those numbers. We, we corrected the historic data, Ruby, and even with that, Laura, Patty, and I, with coordination with Mike Zuba, still feel his projection is a good one because he's factored in that return. But it's all laid out there on paper, page four to five, and obviously you'll make your decision. But I just want to be clear that since the last workshop, so to speak, we went to work on this exact question, how accurate is that projection? Um, so just know that is very current analysis in that document, the Q&A document. Yeah, but Ruby, I guess the, the, the bigger question is, are you really saying this because you don't, you somehow, we don't um, feel that Malone and McBroom is going to be accurate over the next year, which I agree, but I don't know which way they're not gonna be accurate. Um, or are you saying, you know, you know, we we are if we're if we're wrong, we're going to be living with an average class size that's over the guideline. I mean, I, I mean, because that's the only way you're going to get the efficiency that you want. Because I, I quite frankly, if we're not, if we do get the third, the twenty, we're we're back to adding a section or not. I mean, what's the real? What's your recommendation though? There. Recommendation is that it is that we stay with the current number of teachers, regardless of what, five. regardless of what the number is next year. I think we have those conversations. If we're looking at a particular grade, let's just say third grade is at twenty four point three. Well, then, yeah, we have the conversation of you know what for this particular year we're going to be point three outside the recommended guidelines. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we've been. That's how we're going to find these efficiencies, guys, because we know that this particular year that we're in and next year, it's an anomaly. We, it's a crapshoot. We don't know which way it's going to go because of COVID. Yeah. No, um, I just wanted I to be clear. Just... I just wanted to be clear in what you're saying because I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. I just want to be very clear no. what the implications are. 
if, Tony, if, if I may. I so, agree. Yeah. I agree with, yeah. well, I mean, just. Can I, as a quick I, perspective here. Yeah. When I arrived as superintendent, you had this exact same issue. So in that summer, when we arrived, we had to working with the board. So it wasn't done unilaterally by the administration, but at that exact conversation, do you add sections or not? Do you live with higher class sizes or do you add sections? So this board working with administration has that exact history of doing that. You set it now, but if you have to adjust later, you adjust later. Then the board decided yes. So then that was about a $250,000 gap that the board had to figure out how to cover in that first year. So I just wanted to connect those dots. Yeah, I mean, here, yeah, I would. So go ahead, Melissa. No, 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 please fin, fin, go ahead. Julie. I guess I my, just wanted... my thing on this is um, at the elementary level, let, let's put middle school and high school in a different bucket. But at the elementary level, the most critical thing in successful education is a small number of students. You want well-qualified people and you want to give them the tools, but ultimately the, the smaller the class, the more successful the educational delivery is going to be. For years, per this, particularly this, at the young, particularly at I'm the younger talking, ages. I'm talking purely elementary. I mean, fifth grade maybe starts getting a little bit more on the middle school levels, but whatever. This district has maintained its classroom guidelines to try to do its best as a public school to provide that level of personalized instruction that is necessary at those younger age. That's where we're dealing with the identification of any sort of learning issues, any sort of emotional, social issues. Like there's so much going on besides just teaching ABCs, one, two, threes, and how those all come together. And I, if you make, if you make the decision to cut the section now and then it turns out three months from now, you see that these people really are coming back. You see that we really are sitting there like, holy crap, we do need this section. It's very difficult to add it back in. And what happens is you get the boomerang the following year, you get slammed with that, that delta that we didn't have in our budget. And every year, our principals at our lower schools will adjust and shift teachers amongst grades. And they do reduce sections when it makes sense. As a board of education member, I am not on board exceeding our guidelines. They're there for a reason. We've talked about it like ad nauseum about the benefits of having a smaller number of students in a classroom. And to talk about taking it away in a year in which we are gonna be reacclimating younger students to being in a classroom for the first time and putting extra pressures on the teachers in that year is difficult. The other thing is you have to recognize and the principals have to guide us on this, different cohorts have a different level of need. Some cohorts, maybe you can manage with a slightly bigger class size. Some cohorts, just because of the mix of students, you need to be respectful that that cohort has extra needs and requires a little bit of extra staff. As a board of education member, I fully respect the need to be efficient with our resources, but not when it comes to sacrificing the very core principle that, that this district sits on. I agree. Thank I you, think Gina. pushing I think the envelope on class size guidelines at the elementary level is a, is a mistake. I've said that before. I will continue to advocate for that. Patty and I always work on um, shifting staff when enrollment needs require, but to, to proactively start cutting sections is, is a mistake. Victor? Uh, you were going to say something? Yeah. So I, I agree a lot with what's being said here. And um, I'm, I'm just going to, I have a lot Which of things part? to say. Probably Which, not on, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I would disagree with Gina. Look, I, I think guidelines are guidelines, right? I think a COVID year is a whipsaw. I think planning against that whipsaw is difficult. If we find ourselves, I don't, I don't think you're hearing from us a lack of commitment to delivering what we need to deliver, but in a year, to Hillary's point, when everybody I know has been furloughed, just taking pay cuts and everything like that, we have to find ways. And if that entails that for a partial year, we're going to be above the guidelines and then we can right size in the following and we'll have this discussion next year. Right. So, so it's not like we're making, we're not, we're not, we're, not, grade, we're not making, we're not, we're not, we're not making fatalistic uh, decisions. Right. 
third so grade is I, a transition I, I, year. I do, I do, oh, I do, cool. I do think I. I do. Let, let, let him finish. finish. Let, let Victor finish. So I, I do think that, and, and like Melissa said, I, I, I am a little bit disappointed as to some of the, um, uh, you know, we're an oversight board, right? We're not on an operational board and we're reminded of that many times, right? But we're just trying to ask the right questions. So to Melissa's point is, is, is all this, uh, talks to hiring strategy, right? No, not having a strategy is a strategy in of, it, of itself, uh, but, but we feel that, that that strategy perhaps hasn't been articulated well enough and that there are opportunities. And that's, and that's the dialogue we wanna have. But that's right. different than properly staffing to meet our guidelines. Let, let, me, the, we, we, let me just say one thing, we okay. have a strategy it matches every district around us to strategy to get to excellence. I would urge to have that conversation so the board fully understands it. Again, in the Q&A, a lot of time went into answering the question about the strategy. I would urge you to look at that document and, and make this maybe or not the time, but there has been a strategy, there will be a strategy modifying off that given what the document explains, there are a lot of limitations for public schools. And again, I've worked independent, Catholic and higher ed. This is the most limiting sector as it relates to human resource strategy. So the board, you need to have the conversation, you need to go through it. So you're very clear on where you have opportunities and where you do not. But I can assure you this team here pushes for excellence, pushes for the best hires, pushes for efficiency and pushes for effectiveness. So we need to help so let, let, board understand. Yeah, one, one um, let, me, let me bring this conversation a little bit back to earth. Um, so what I'm hearing about hiring strategy, multi-year budgeting and planning are all of those things that I think need to be worked on. Absolutely. Uh, I think that um, as a board, um, I think those are some of the high priority items that we have to have to push. Um, but, um, but at the moment, right? at the moment, right? What we have in front of us seems to be a budget that not everyone is comfortable with. And like every year, and we've said this before because of the fact that the only thing that moves the needle is staffing, salary and benefits. That's, that's really, I mean, out of, you know, out of all these line items, we've pretty much nickel and dimed ourselves down to something that has a two handle because it's very, very difficult to make those decisions around staffing without the guidance of, of the leadership team. Because it's not like we as a board can actually say, all right, you have you know, you only have X amount of dollars to work with. That's, you know, just spend it in the way you think is advisable. That's really not the way we operate, right? So while I want to take the issue of affordability, ultimately, which came up uh, with Hillary, which is a discussion we should be having, but also more importantly, a discussion the Board of Finance should be having about affordability. Um, we have to keep that in mind as well. Um, you know, I, I think that the place the discussion really is evolving to right now is that unless we want to approve a budget as is, the only place that to go next is the staffing discussions. And I don't, and I don't think it's, 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 you know, it's salary and benefits, right? And I don't think it's necessarily, you know, what Ruby said, although that's something to be discussed, you know, in terms of looking at K to five sections, but it's, but it's, but it's, broadly that, that category of staffing. And, and I know that a lot of work is done in terms of making sure that we protect the programs which we, which we pride ourselves in Weston, but ultimately, unless we want to approve this budget, that's place, those are the places we need to go. Um, and I'm not sure, and I don't think any board member is exactly sure at which spot to focus on. And that's kind of where we need your help because I'm not sure that this is this budget number is one that would get a majority approval at this point. 
right? I mean, please comment. Tony, if I can just give yeah. my perspective again, because I, I almost feel like I'm hearing two messages and I don't know if the other principals are hearing the same thing. I felt yeah. like uh, when Ruby made her comment earlier about the middle school, I felt like I was being criticized because maybe I cut too deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was worried about class size. I, that, that was my, yes, that's yeah. exactly what I tried so, to imply. <laughs> so I, I, I just want to reassure the board because, you know, the principals, we've been, all of us have been in the district for many years now and have gone through this process. And we've always been working with a board who has reaffirmed the board guidelines as something that separate, that really makes Weston stand apart and is what helps draw families to our community. And we've heard almost every single board member talk about the high quality of the teaching staff that we have and the teaching experience that our students have. And then I hear the other message, which is the place to go is where it is salary and benefits and, and, um, and FTE, which is gonna undermine the strength of our district as I see it. We yeah, Dan, are, I, I, I guess it's not what I'm, what I meant to say by that is that if the board is not comfortable with this budget, there is no other, you know, they may not go there, but it's, but let's not fool ourselves. It's the, the only place left to go, which, which is, which is a very difficult conversation. So it's just, it's just being practical that that's where the big numbers are. And that if the board is not comfortable with the budget, there, there really is no other place to go. Right. And, 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 I would just, and yeah. also, I'm not, I'm not, I, there is no issue today with the number of teachers teaching the number of students. I have, I have zero, pro, I agree with how it is being laid out today. My challenge is the outside variable that was presented to us, and that is enrollment. And we are paying a third party to give us an enrollment number for next year. I disagree with that enrollment number. And that enrollment number then leads to a particular number of sections, right? So my challenge is not the, the, the student to teacher ratio based today. My challenge is the student to teacher ratio next year based on Malone and McBroom's projection. Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to echo a little bit of what Ruby said, but also, I really think, you know, in our in terms of our mindset, what we have to be looking at is is long term, not year to year, and that's where I think we're 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 having kind of a, a little bit of a disagreement here. Um, I would say, looking at the long term projections, knowing that COVID is a little bit of an unknown in the short term, that based on the long term projections, it doesn't seem responsible to hire additional teaching staff right now. That's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about any reductions of current existing teaching staff, just planning for the future. Keep in mind that every, you know, to the point that Lisa and Dan were making earlier with, with respect to tenure. And I think there's a clear um, statement that the board isn't really understanding a lot of the, the long-term hiring implications, but we, we wanna make sure that the staff that we have right now that is performing excellently in our school districts that we support and we maintain and we retain and we encourage and we develop and we promote and we, we do all these great things to keep Weston as excellent as it is. I just don't think that right now for, for our town and to Victor and Hillary's points, you know, people in Weston, you know, it's, it's, these are tough times. I, I just don't see how most businesses aren't hiring right now. And I don't think the Weston school district should be hiring additional staff right now when we have, we have projections that we've seen for the past 10 years that show consistent decline in enrollment. That's, that's all I'm saying. And if that means in one year in a, in a section that we're over our guidelines, I think you have to look to the long-term benefit to our taxpayers and to our preserving the rate as low as we can, that, that that is a bigger benefit than a short-term blip in, in you know, one or two years with one or two sections going above guidelines. And keeping mindful of the fact that we have learned a tremendous amount this year in what we can do with our children remotely and how we can reach out and develop 
and, and, and maintain their, their social emotional health during difficult time period, such as this global pandemic. I mean, we have tools now in our toolkit that we did not have a year or two ago. So if we do have a little bit of a blip in terms of a, of a class or a grade or a section going above a guideline, we have a lot more resources now available to us to help those students. So let's take advantage of what we've learned in a difficult time period. It's not do something. Melissa, you're cutting out. So, Melissa, I have we got a, most of it. We got yeah. most of it. I have a question, oh, Tommy. I have a question, yeah. Melissa. Uh, yeah. Okay. Melissa, I have a question. You're talking about hiring and it's and, and using and tying it to long term projections. And I fully agree you need to plan long term and you need to have long term strategies. But it doesn't change the fact that each August we have a different number of little people walking into our K to five building. And again, I'm going to keep the upper schools off the table a little bit because they're a little bit of a different animal from enrollment. But Every August, you're going to have a different number of little people walking into our K to five school, falling into different grade buckets. And there's no way you're going to be able to project every grade 100% on. So are you saying we should never adjust to accommodate that? I mean, we, Patty and Laura, they, they move their teachers around and shift around and make reductions as needed based on the enrollment walking in the door each August. Right. And we should continue and to we do, do that, that with our I'm existing sure staff. Why Look, I understand there are, there are valid questions because of the funky situation we're in with COVID and the number of homeschool and, and possibly temporary private school placements. But I still don't understand why we're, we, would, we would want to, from an educational perspective, go over our guidelines. G Gina, well, I don't think I, everybody wants to. We're just saying if that's... An, if that's if so that how do you think the parents of the kids in that grade, when every other grade coming through our school gets to have a certain level of service and you're going to tell the kids in the one grade, the one year, sorry, you don't get that. Gina, yeah, I, I think, ahead, Gina, I think to, to, to Lisa's point earlier, it's about the quality of the individual teacher, not whether they have 0.4 students more in the class. Right. Oh, I agree and, with and, that and, 100%, Victor, Right. So, 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 so it, just it's, let it's him transitory. Finish. No, <laughs> it's, I, I it's, agree well, with that, Victor, but it's not like you can just walk in and say, I want to keep A, B, C, and D, E, and F. We've decided we don't want you. Like, we don't have that flexibility. If you, but what we're saying he look at, we're, if you look at trend, though, Gina, if you, if you, and I, I agree with you, let's just isolate K through five. I spent so much of last night just looking at the trends of K through five. In 2014, a thousand students, 984, 953, 939, 911, 901, 878. Gina, every single year K through five is decreasing. I, this particular year, well, but this know, particular I, year. I, I it, think what, what the board is, you know, what some of the members of the board said in, you know, let me phrase it another way, what they're saying in this dif difficult time, let's just have a one year hiring freeze. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, that's, that's really what you're saying, right, Melissa? Is yeah. sticking with yes. 43 sections that like we currently have right now in K through five. Yeah, and then the implications, but, 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 there's there's implications to that. And then the question is, you know, let's 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 kind of let's kind of take it in parts, right? Which is, you know, difficult times, you know, whatever the reason is, we just want to stick with what we have, the implications of that. Can you live with the implications of that? Right? But implications but, but, but are, can not, I just say are one, not can, absolute. Can I just, we, right. No, I'm not saying they're absolute. Implications. Right. right. Can, I, all, can I ask another question? Can I just um, point out, so across K-5 for next year, we are flat with oh, teachers. Yeah. Um, Patty's going down a section, I'll be going up a section. So we do do those shifts across buildings and we always look very carefully at that. It's something we frequently do. Um, and we are projected at Hurlbut to, to increase next year. Now, whether, you know, people believe that projection or not, that's, you know, these conversations come up I would say every budget year since I've been here about are these projections going to really come to fruition, but 
um, you know, that's that's part of the process as we, you know, the board contracts with or looks at um, projection enrollments like every other district does, and that's how we plan for. Um, I, I just, I, I think cutting at the elementary level to make further cuts is, is a big mistake. Look, can, can I say something, Sonny? Can yeah, I, can ahead, I Taffy, say something? Kathy, go ahead. Um, the fact that the enrollment, sorry, the hiring freeze for a year is a very good idea, right? It's positioned that way. It's fiscally responsible this year. I completely agree with it. But to then shift that priority and how we execute that priority to the K to five because of enrollment, which I understand is flawed. And I think it's flawed because we know what young children need. And I don't think that's a movable target. We know what they need, that pushing the guidelines is not wise for those young children who need that support. So why can't we look at that fiscal need, that hiring freeze across the whole teaching district? And why are we looking only at K to five around a place to cut? Because we know that it will dramatically impact those children. Yes, it will. It would dramatically impact the experience of those young children. So hiring freeze, yes. Enrollment issues are real, but at the K to five, it will have direct impact on their learning if we remove a section and increase the class size. Can we look elsewhere for those efficiencies in staffing? And I know now suddenly Dan and Lisa unmute themselves and get all excited because that's the implication here, but that is that solves the problem. Like we're in a gridlock here around do we care enough about our youngest children to give them the attention they need? And I don't think that's in question. We all care enough about our youngest children and we want them to have the best. So can we find the efficiencies somewhere else in our staffing? And yes, have a, a hiring freeze. Taffy, just Is that one, even a question we yeah. can put on the table? Yeah, one, one just I want you to do it uh, as an aside. Uh, if you look at the FTE reductions, the middle school and the high school, so, I mean, are already. They've yeah, they've already have a they've they've contributed yeah. to the reductions, um, and I'm not sure how many physical bodies that is. I have no idea. But in terms of FTE equivalents, there's th almost three FTE equivalents between the two of them, right? So, right. That's, that's which is correct. which is which is great, and and I think that's that's right. Again, though, you have to decide. We have to decide what is non-negotiable because Lisa and Dan were able to say, yeah, I think we can actually wiggle around those three FTEs and do without them and not compromise to the point where it's a mistake. And now we're having a discussion, putting a lot of pressure on Laura and Patty to make the opposite decision to say, we're going to reduce FTEs and it's going to impact our youngest children. And that's a tough place to put them in. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't continue the discussion. I'm just saying, can we look elsewhere for FTEs anywhere across the district to reach the efficiencies we're looking for? Or is it only tied to the K to five enrollment? I recognize Ruby and Melissa, exactly what you're saying that the K to five enrollment says we should be able to pare this down, but. Hey, can I just level set for a second, just so that we're all looking at the same numbers, because I feel like people are, are, are throwing out different numbers. Can you just turn to 94 for me in the budget book? Just so that I'm, I'm clearly understanding this. If I look at page 94 and I look at total classroom teachers, Hurlbut and Wiss, they're at 22 each, correct? And then if I look at 2020, 2021, Hurlbut is at 20, but I think that's a mistake. It should be 21, because if I refer back to page 80, that's what it matches on that page. And WIS is at 22. So that means for this fiscal year, we're at 43. And for next proposed fiscal year, we're at 44. Are, are we all on the same page with those numbers? Mm -hmm. Ruby, okay. I think yes. one, of the, one of the areas of, because um, I had to wrap my head around this too, um, is the is the proposed staffing in the budget. So this year, you're correct. We don't have 20 classroom teachers, we have 21. 
that's because of the late add at the end of the summer because of the enrollment increase. Yeah, that we, that only, wasn't, we added we added post budget, right? So that would not be in this number. No, 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 no. So I I fixed it myself, and so I'm I. That's what I keep referencing of a pickup of one teacher. So it's forty three fiscal teachers, forty three teachers this fiscal year, forty four proposed for next year. Okay, that's what I just wanted all of us on this page to all of us on this Zoom to be on the same page. That's that's where then I keep going to stay flat to this year at 43. But I don't think that this one is accurate either because Patty don't no, you it's have- not, It's not, I've got- You have 20, 23 right. this year. I've got 23 teachers this year, I'm going to 22. I'm reducing one section because we added a section, remember in July because our numbers went so yeah. high. Yep. So Phil, can, so, can we just make sure so you that are, this particular so, so, page is so updated? Is all, so, so WIS is already reducing by one. Correct. And uh, and Hurlbut's increasing by one. And uh, the middle school, that's correct, right? You're reducing by one and a half, right? Dan? Yes. Um, and again, just a quick refresher. The way I was able to achieve those savings was enrollment driven, the same uh, conversation that Laura and Patty were having for their staffing needs. We have a smaller cohort coming into sixth grade. So we're reducing our number of academic sections from nine uh, to, uh, to eight in seventh grade, like we did for sixth grade this year. Two grade levels okay. will have eight sections. The other thing we did, the major change was, was the math, how we the math level. Well. Thank you, yes. But we've already, okay. so, when you asked about going elsewhere, remember over the last six years, we've been cutting elsewhere in the budget. We've, with administrative yeah. assistance you mentioned, with custodians, um, yeah. we've tried to not touch- So let me just, let's just go through the, sorry, Dan, to cut you off, but the high school is reducing by 0.3 FTE, correct, Lisa? Uh, that's from budget, but not from actual. And what it was actual? It, it looks like 30, right now, 37.2. 37.2. But remember, that's tricky because we're just talking about the core academics. Right. Of English, yep. math, science, social studies. That doesn't include yep. all those other things. Yeah, right. no, that's fine. <sighs> to add to the Phil, conversation. Can we just update you, this you, page, you please? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, Ruby. I just wanted to add one piece. <clears throat> we were talking about K-5 between Hurlbut and WIS, the numbers going one down for, for WIS and one up for Hurlbut. Do you have to always- It's a wash. No, it, well, you have to take into account people who are on leave as well, who may be coming back. So, I mean, that could be, you know, in any one year, you could have people coming in and out on leave, obviously, but I do have at least I have to go back and check at least one person coming back on leave uh, next year uh, from leave. So, so it's let, the time of the year where we hear about those things. Well, listen, it's it's 11 o'clock, it's 11.05. The question here is, it we're, we're going around in a circle right now. What is it that we're asking the leadership team to come back to do? Um, I, I don't know that we're asking them to, to do anything. I mean, I, I think we have a, a lot of the information that we need. I think we just have to make decisions and votes on, on, on what we want to do. I mean, I, I would love a, a long, robust conversation about hiring strategy, retention, tenure, everything, and under, really understand it and set goals. But I mean, this isn't, this is last hour of our budget workshop isn't the appropriate right. Right. You know, I mean, Absolutely. A, you know, so with a, respect a to the conversation we're having on staffing, with respect yeah. to the conversation we're having on staffing, as it relates to the budget decisions we have to make, um, what is it, if anything, that we're asking the leadership team to come back with at the next I, meeting? I would propose, my, my proposal would be the, um, to not hire the, I think it's the first grade the, the additional FTE in the elementary grades. I, I, thought it, I thought it was allocated in the budget book, perhaps for first grade. And mm -hmm. I would just say that um, no small business in America 
that's experiencing decreasing revenue right now is hiring. And I just don't see how, if we're being true to our tax base and to our neighbors and our residents, that we should be hiring additional teachers when the long-term projections show decreasing enrollment. Mm -hmm. That's my, my, my view on that, but I, I understand others may disagree. I totally agree. And, and one, one other thing, like in, in line with the enrollment, am I mistaken here when I'm still on page 94, in line with the enrollment decrease over the last six, seven, eight years that you read out so, so clearly, uh, Ruby, we're also seeing a decrease in FTEs accordingly. I mean, we don't have 25 FTEs in WIS anymore. We're, we're proposing 22. I mean, there is a decrease and each one of those FTEs, I'm assuming represents a class of 20 children, you know, um, or more. So it's not like we've been sitting flat for the last six years with our FTEs at those grade levels. We have been decreasing accordingly. I'm not sure how we can decrease more, but well, that's. I mean, I think the numbers Taffy will show you that, that, you know, while enrollment has declined by, you know, just look what I'm looking at from a peak of 2610 to 2273 where we are today, we have a certified, we have a teaching FTE proposal of 219.7 and back in 2013 we had 217.74. So it is a very modest decrease compared to a multi-hundred student enrollment decrease. I don't think that that's proportional. Point taken. Yep. I don't know if it's first grade. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still just stick at the K through five level because I think for just the increase I would have is is, is the third grade. But I, I, I think it's just at the K through five level, um, I, I would not hire. I would stick with 43 um, teachers. And just and to have the guidelines, make sure the it's guidelines clear, we're not well? hiring this year. We're going down a section at WIS and up one at Hurlbut. Hurlbut is projected to go up 29 students next year. Um, so Laura, so isn't, isn't it a wash? It's isn't a wash, it a wash yes. then? Across K-5. So why are we talking, like we're not it's in hiring. the budget it's book as, a, as an increase. It, it's yeah, but a, there's a decrease, but there's a decrease in WIS. Right. So, Correct. Not, so not, not they're in moving and they move. That's not irrelevant. According to budget, not from budget to budget. We're, we're, we're now talking 43 teachers between the two school versus 44 teachers based on a possibly inflated enrollment, which we will find out if it actualizes or not. So is there a new hire at Hurlbut? Um, just to clarify, if we, we no. currently will be, hold on. One quick second. So year over year, in terms of where we are actually, so currently we have 44, we have 44 uh, staff members or section between at the K-5 level. Next year, it will, it will also be 44 because there's a reduction, there, there is a reduction um, at the WIS and there's an increase at HOPE. Right. So the but, net, so the net, from a net, net to net, we're really flat. Yeah, That's no, but budget, budget to budget, no, budget, budget to budget. That's budget to budget is different. We're, we're challenging Why? the number of sections in total based on enrollment. Forget the, inc forget the add and subtract. We're just challenging the number of sections in total because of the proposed enrollment for K through five. And I guess my point on that Ruby is our administrators at the lower schools have started outreach to the families that may have temporarily pulled their kids from the schools and are getting feedback about how many of those may be coming back in. That 11 feedback, of them already. That feedback indicates that we may be getting that bump. All I'm saying is to make that decision now is premature. I am okay if we wanna have this section be kind of out there as it's in for now, but we're gonna be watching it very closely and may cut it 
I'm okay with that. I'm just not okay with making the decision right now because we do have information that lends some credibility to the bump. Um, and so buying, buying up to three more months of time to further validate the number, I don't see the harm in taking that time. I'm still not 100% not clear. So is there a new hire? That's my question. I don't know. Budget, here's yeah, and, I don't, and, I'm not, and I'm not clear sections. on what we mean by, I'm not clear on what we mean by the staffing well, FTE is a wash year to year versus the budget is a, not a wash. So where well, is that let's, difference? Let's have, let's have Laura explain then. And Laura, if you want me to help, I will. Yeah, so the question um, about staffing is, is, is it, yes, it's a wash across K-5. Is there a new hire? I guess that's the question. No, because WIS will go decrease a section, Hurlbut will increase a section, and we make those shifts across the buildings. That's actual, Internally. That's actual this year to budget for next year, though. Correct. What comes into play, guys, is when we set our budget and what gets voted on by the town that becomes the official budget number that we use to roll forward to do to manage our increase decrease in the budget we approved last year we were off essentially off by two sections we added two sections post budget so those two sections uh, kind of automatically become an increase to this year's budget because they weren't in last year's budget but actuals about the way we are doing business this year to the proposal, there's no overall change, but we get caught with the fact that we were off last year and we had to add sections post post budget approval. But but Gina, correct, and I think that if, was for the same yeah. reason. Gina was was yes. that was for the same reason as it seemed. You know, there were questions about whether the enrollment projections would correct. actually come to fruition, and they did. Right. And then we had last minute. Adjustments if, to make, if, which on an aside wreaks havoc with class size design. Well, it also wreaks havoc with hiring yeah. because if we wait till August, look like Laura, <laughs> we uh, then we just don't get the staffing, or it's really difficult to get the teachers. So if you don't, it there is a real, there is a real savings. I mean, it's it's if you don't add a, I mean, I get bottom line. You may not want to do it, but if you don't add a section at Hurlbut, there is a savings. Let's stop saying Hurlbut because it's I, I don't want to put it on Hurlbut. It's a it's a K through five. I, I'm just it. I'm just I know just I know, but I don't want to sing the budget book. I know. Just let's just say K through five. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and I, th I think it would be helpful to think of the reduction that Pat, Patty's making as separate from from the other. I think that's where we're getting all confused. I don't think we should be comparing like, well, we go down here, we go up here, you know, and, and I think, you know, Patty's making a decision or, or, the, or the administrative team is making a decision with respect to that section based on enrollment that's going down. And I think that correspondingly, it doesn't make sense to have an increase in a section um, for, for the very same reason that we have historic enrollment decline and future projected enrollment decline. Um, so I think you have to look at them separately so whether it's a wash or not you know is, is irrelevant what's what's what what i am just so i we're clear in what i'm saying is i would not i would not support an increase if you want to refer to it as that section or a hiring increase or you know however we're we're calling it but i think that um um well, and I just want clear? to be clear, we don't have a reduction at one building and say, oh, well, let's just put it the other and make it a wash. We do look, I mean, the enrollment is based building specific based on the number of sections we need. Then, if you know, because Patty's happy to go down and I'm happy to go up, we can make staffing adjustments across the buildings, but we don't budget that way. We look at the- oh, Somebody said classes. that, I, the wash. Right. I was just, that was what I was responding to. Yeah. Well, no, because, no, right. I know because we're not hiring a person, that person, because of the reduction, we can make shifts across buildings. Now, um, Bill, I, you know, I know that you, you, the leadership team has scrubbed this, but, you know, are there any other, you know, is, is, is there any value in um, re-looking at the whole um, staffing area 
and saying, okay, is there any other places we could we could look for some efficiencies here at this point in the budget process? Did you say Bill or Phil? I didn't Bill. know. Yeah. Yeah, I think the team can answer. I'm gonna just be politely direct, no. I mean, the things we would bring you, but you as a board have to decide. Uh, and I think the team here has to decide, this is your district going forward. Yeah. But I would say no, because the things we'll bring to you will be things that will substantially undermine the quality of this district going forward. And I'm going to say this, I'm very excited about uh, exciting people coming in here to be superintendent. And I'm very excited for this district because I've given five years to it. Um, and I'm excited everywhere I've gone, I care about who follows me and that excellence continues. And, and I think you want to be very cautious that you let that new leader uh, come in, work with the team here and grapple with you about all these very difficult questions. Because these are the exact questions that are going on in New Canaan, Greenwich, Darien, go over to Westchester County. These are the exact questions and they're multi-year challenges, multi-year issues. Uh, and I, but I, I will say to you, no, but you need to hear from the team. But I would urge you and hear me say it first, embrace the new leader coming, embrace the new leader working with this team to work with you to resolve these very difficult questions over a couple year period and not, you know, put somebody at a limit who's coming in by set of decisions now that will make it really difficult for them to do th the things you want as the new leader. Mm -hmm. Can I just make one more comment? I just maybe can bring some of this enrollment data to life um, as how it unfolds. So currently today we have 124 kindergartners. We have two new students who just moved into town. We'll be starting by the end of next week. That puts us at 126. I know 11 incoming first graders for next year, just based on um, some of the responses I've gotten. Um, so that puts us at 137. That leaves us eight shy of the projected enrollment, which is, is not unrealistic to think that we might get those additional eight students by the end of this year or over the summer. We continue to have students enrolled throughout the year. Um, and I have not heard back from all of our um, students who withdrew this year. Laura, I 1000% agree with you um, and thank you for that. Now let's have the exact same conversation for second into third. So are you, are, are you at, at, Laura, are you at 131? Um, as, Cause that's what it was as of January 7th for second grade. I couldn't find my mute button. So um, today in second grade, we have 124. We know of eight students um, who have responded so far that they will be returning for third grade. Um, we have- Wait, 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 wait. That's, I, enrollment for October 1st for second grade was at 131. And then on January 7th, it was confirmed at 131. So now we, as of today, we have 124. Yes, we did have some uh, students move and withdraw. Okay, so that puts the pickup into third grade even greater because 19 was already inflated and that was off of the 131. So now we're saying we're gonna have a pickup of 26, which we've definitely never done before. How many have confirmed into third grade? Patty, I know that you made some phone calls already. Was it eight? So the incoming yeah. third survey yeah. comes out of my survey because okay. uh, you know they withdrew out of our building. So we have eight confirmed coming back so far. I think Patty spoke at the last meeting about historically um, third grade movement in. It is, it is typically a year where we see a large number moving in, but those, uh, the new No, we, we, we had, I can give you pick up second into third step pick up 10 last year, five the year before, 16 the year before, eight the year before, 11 the year before, 15 the year before. Never yeah. have we had 26. And if you minus eight from the 26, I mean, even 18 is a lot. Well, I actually, I actually we went, had 23 ahead, new students this year in third grade. But however, out of those 23 new students, seven of them chose to go homeschooling 
and a couple then uh, went to private school and moved. That's where the numbers are different. But yeah, I did actually have 23 new students and I have another one coming in this year. And then you know, last year, you're right, the year before, we only had eight new students. The year before that, I had 16. So it, it, it's so, it fluctuates. Yeah, again, just we, Ruby, we heard that, we went back, we adjusted the historic figures. I talked with Patty, I talked with Laura, I talked with Mike Zuba. So that growth number of 19, which now is a bit bigger, we felt, and again, you'll make your own decision, but we felt as the administrators tying, talking to Zuba that 19, if you average out those number of years of growth and add on the estimate of the homeschoolers coming back, you get around that 19. And again, you know, we, and Zuba's already said, their confidence interval for you over a four or five year period is 2.5%. So you can move that, which amounts to not a lot of students. Sorry, Patty, can you confirm your enrollment right now in third grade? Yeah, we're at 145 students right now with another oh, one okay. coming in in two weeks. That's where we are now. And then last year, it was 135 in second grade. So you actually only had a pickup of 10. Mm -hmm. So right. 10 students, Correct. not where you, sorry, I thought you said a higher number. Well, I did, I did because that's how many new students we actually enrolled in the school. I enrolled 23 new students, new third graders in our building. Seven of them chose then to go, well, no, I shouldn't, of those new students, they're not all new students. You have to look at the whole pie kind of thing, but of our total enrollment, seven of those students chose to go homeschooling. Another um, three students went to private school and then we did have a couple of students who moved. So that's how we ended up with the, the plus 10. Okay, yeah, I, whether they're new, because you're gonna have students move out, you're gonna have students come in, I'm just looking at total enrollment to total enrollment. Correct, so it was an increase. We projected to have nine new students and we got 10 new students. But if we didn't have the homeschoolers choose, it would be 17 new students. So back to my, back to my original statement, it, we haven't seen a 26 student pickup. Whether they are new, whether they're old, whatever, we've never seen a 26 student pickup in a particular year. I guess the real question is, do you, do you do it now or do you wait until you get more information before the budget actually uh, gets approved by the Board of Finance? I mean, this is what we did last year. We, we chose not to go that route. Remember, we cut the third grade section last year, and then we came back in July and we added the section. So that's what we did last year. We, uh, that's right. We, we took a risk, right? And it did not pay off. We had to add it back in, and now we have that burden now. So I say let's not do that again. I, I say third grade is inflated. I, I do. I just historically with, again, the movement year to year in enrollment, I, I don't, I, I don't think we need seven sections. I, I think we can, based on Malone and McBroom's projection, I think, I think there's, we can optimize here and plan for six sections and we just keep reevaluating as the year goes, as the year goes on. I don't know who agrees with, who's uh, in agreement with Ruby on this. How many kids in each class if we do not add a section? It, it depends on enrollment. I know, but as of now? Per, per class right now, with seven section, 21.4. If we reduce by one section, we'll be at 25 per class. But that's we can't if we do agree. That. No, but Taffy, who's to say that we're going to have 150 students in third grade? That's what I'm saying. A pickup. Well, you do it. You do students. it with a. Well, you do it with a public caveat that says, if that enrollment does not hold, that there's another section, just like last year. I mean, as as Laura said, you, like you're not. We're not going to march into the year saying that we're going to surpass guidelines for all those sections. I mean, I don't. I can't approve that. Yeah, I, we, I think we either. You know, I I think you could do one of two things. You can either not do anything and wait, or reduce it and say that if we, you know, if we actually trip the guideline in the summer, we have to reevaluate. Right. That's it. You have to make a public trigger 
to reevaluate. To reevaluate and to act on. I mean, I don't know that Not I'm going to like re. Okay. Well, I think that's the debate. I mean, I mean, I think some people are sound as if they're okay exceeding the guidelines. I think a couple of us are not okay with exceeding the guidelines. Um, and I think that it's important that the public know where we're headed on this. I, I, I totally get questioning the projection right now. I, I think that's um, probably fair. But if we're gonna if we're gonna let the public be aware of that, let's make sure it's not just our school public population that it's the entire town. Oh, agreed. Uh, and to be clear, as a board, this board has precedent within the summer having that discussion then. When I arrived, that was right. one of those discussions that occurred. And right. the decision was by that board to incur an additional quarter million in expense for two sections to keep to the class size guidelines. Now, this board may choose to have a different discussion. I just want to assure you that at least the team represented here is not going to unilaterally add sections. It's done in close coordination with you as a board because you have to vote to add those sections. So there's clear precedent in this town to have that exact conversation that you want to have. Um, just I would caution, it is part of the strategy. We know very clearly that when we go to hire in August, uh, it's harder to find the quality teacher that Weston needs and demands and should have. Uh, and I just want to be very clear about that. Again, it's tied to, on your team here, many, many years of experience within the strategy that's used to hire. And, and I think going forward, if we're going to do this and put this much weight on the enrollment projections, which I agree we pay for where it's there for a reason, then it's a standing decision we make that based on enrollment we're reducing sections and in July we reevaluate and that's what we do every year now, I just, this, year's, this year's an anomaly though Tony yeah. this year's yeah. an anomaly no because... this year's an anomaly and and I'm I you know I think you know if, if it sounds like there's a number of people who say let's let's reduce and then reevaluate I'm fine doing it as long as we have a real honest discussion about reevaluation in the in the in the summertime right? Um, if we have to actually increase it, but, but there's, there's a, con there's a, there's an unintended consequence to this. And that is, if you do decide to add, it's going to, it be, it is going to crowd out other things that you have budgeted for, right? So it, it's an operating expense that then will give Phil a huge headache to try to. And that's where then you have to maybe take a step back and look at the budget as a whole. If you're sitting there saying right. you, want, you want to reduce a section size, but we're going to come back and evaluate that. If we're going to cut the SPED contingency by half and we're going to come back and reevaluate that, all of a sudden, that's a quarter of a million dollars that we have now like pulled back on that may very well be legitimate expense that we need to incur. So that's, that's the balance that we have to go through. Um, yes, we have to make decisions about certain things as it relates to are we adding this section, but we got to take a step back and think about everything else we're cutting. And if you're going to cut that sped contingency and you're going to cut a section, that's just kind of a recipe for like a big pile. Well, of I, I think then the discussion with the board of finance has to be very uh, explicit about potentially having to go back for, uh, you know, an, you know, a, a special, um, special allocation. Right. But, but, but that's, you know, those are the things we have to weigh, right? Um, Good question. Yeah. Can we reduce the section and then instead of saying we'll reevaluate in August since it's now, you know, the end of January, can we say we'll reevaluate like in April or May? No, what I'm saying is we have to leave it in now with the mm -hmm. caveat that we will continue to reevaluate and could potentially adjust based on new facts we oh, can't okay. go trying to go back and add to our budget is a disaster no you either we can approve with a caveat that we're going to continue to look at these specific things and we may come back to you with a reduction that we can easily do i i would i wouldn't plan for that i would i would go ahead and and put the this you know the stake in the ground now saying 43 sections and then and then we continue because i i think the pickup of 26 students is i just do not agree with it For, forget forget third grade 
forget even K through five. Let's just talk about total Weston. Total Weston is saying we are flat in enrollment. Westport is down. New Canaan is down. Wilton hasn't come out with their, their budget book yet. I couldn't find it online. We as a district, are we saying that everyone else around us is, is, is uh, decreasing in enrollment and we're gonna say that we're gonna be flat? Like, I think that's, th what message are we going out with? I personally, in my gut, do not think we're gonna be flat. Yeah, I think- I agree right. with Ruby. And I think if you take it one step further, Ruby, even if, if you're wrong or the projections are wrong, we're all wrong, you know, we, we're still, we still need to think long-term and long-term is showing decline, not up. So why would we saddle ourselves with something extra right now that's, that's unnecessary in these challenging times? Our town is in challenging times. And we have, and we have, and we have, four, and we have four buildings and we have four buildings of staff to balance it out, not two. We need a, Victor, I hear you, but you, you can't, there's certification issues that. Uh, there's, all, there's always exceptions. Yeah, but there's always uh, opportunities. Uh, please, I, 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 please, I, let Ken and the others speak to that. I, I hear the desire for flexibility there within the public sector, state certification requirements tied to grade levels. And remember what Lisa said earlier, about that. So we will try, this team will be super flexible, but there, there's serious guardrails that in the public sector in public ed are put up as it relates to staffing issues. And I, okay, I just let's, 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 really let's do, let's do this for now. This, this is going to be a long, this is going to be another conversation before we approve the budget. Seems like the majority of people are, are in favor of uh, reducing it and then, and then reevaluating in the summer. Phil, why don't you account for that now. We have another, we're going to have another long discussion before we approve the budget to revisit that. Think long and hard about that because, because if we are, if we're wrong and have to flip back, we have, we, the winds are against us in terms of our having to uh, take this out of our operating budget next year. I mean, it's not a reason not to do it, but everyone's eyes have to be wide open on what it means to actually then have to add and make room for it in, in our operating budget. But why don't, why don't we do that for now? Because it seems like that's where the majority is heading. And then let's, let's reevaluate before we actually uh, approve the budget, okay? Um, so we have a half hour left. I would really love to nail down the capital budget if, if we, if, if, if if it's ready, Phil, or if not, yeah. Um, let me let me try to get Mike on the line. I I, I think we did send out to everyone revise uh, capital sheets, and it's also posted um, on Cape. Let me try to get Mike to join us. Give me a few minutes, please. Yeah. While he is um, grabbing Mike, I had a question. Oh wait. Tony, do you want to stay away from the Q and A? Because I had a question in the Q and A booklet. Sure. While we're while waiting for Mike. Okay. So I had a question when we start going through the FTEs by school. Oh, and by the way, um, the reason the reason um, I also think it's good at this point to actually put in the the lower school. Uh, adjustment it's because we have a community, uh, we have a, a community forum tomorrow evening. And so um, we'll probably also be hearing from uh, the community on the entire budget and where things stand at this point. So Dan, this question is for you. On page 33 of the Q&A under Appendix B, the very first uh, line is one middle school art teacher at 0.5 FTE, correct? Then if you turn to page 82 in the budget book, it shows art at 1.4 FTE. So that means you have one person at a 0.9 FTE and then another person at a 0.5 FTE. Is that correct? Sorry, I was having trouble finding my mute button there. Um, Ken may be able to join me for this one. No, we have 1.0 FTE in art. 
And actually, um, I believe the the other hire was a 0. 0.6. So that may not be trued up to the hire versus the budget proposed because that was a hire over the summer. All right, we, we have to double check these numbers because all of the all of these conversations are based upon the data that you're giving to us. Mm -hmm. So if the data is incorrect, then I, I'm looking at page 82 and page 82, which is the middle school enrollment and staffing, it says 1.4 FTE. And then the Q&A document that you gave us on page 33, it says you have one art teacher at a 0.5. That, that's correct. Dan, Dan currently has an art teacher at a 0.5. Okay, in addition so to the point until in addition to the 1.0, I don't have just 0.5. In addition yes, to the yes, 0.9. One, yeah, he has a 1.5. In addition to the 0.9, right? So it's one point, it's point for a total FTE of 1.4 in art in middle school. If you're saying you have a 0.5 here, then you have a 0.9 elsewhere, correct? I'm just getting to the 1.4. Okay, the way I remember this happening over the summer, we had we had budgeted a 1.5 and we needed to hire somebody who we had to hire at the 0.6 level uh, in, in communication with Dr. Craw. And we took some staffing that was originally allocated for, um, for our reading support and did not hire the full staffing and, and use that to, to balance this art. But going into next year, uh, we're putting the uh, art back to what the true need is and putting the allocation for reading support back to reading. So I believe it's not, that that could be where the, the confusion is between last year's proposed budget, what our actual is, what our um, proposed budget for next year is. I'm, so is your proposed budget for next year 1.4? No. It, it, it is, it is then. If there's any change to that, um, let's just double check that. That's to Ruby's point. Um, based on what we presented to the board, we have a 1.4. If, if that has changed, let's, let's have a discussion about that. Please. Maybe, maybe. So I, I guess, I, again, going back to finding efficiencies, this is, this is, this is, this is how we need to start looking at this, you guys. No, I, I stand corrected. It is 1.4. I'm sorry, I confused myself with the changes because I knew we had a change. Okay, so then um, and the that's reason the is, that, Ruby, because uh, two years ago uh, in the budget process through the curriculum committee, we added um, a second second trimester of art in seventh and eighth grade. That's the additional point four over over and above the one point oh. So we have a full time art teacher and a part time art teacher. And that full time art teacher. Because you added additional art classes, you need an additional staff. But that staff, I'm challenging that 0.5 because that 0.5 then receives full benefits. So, it, is there conversation okay. to have it? Do you, do you see where I'm going with yes, this? As yes, a and that is exactly four. why we had to do that to hire this staff member over the summer. Okay. That became a hiring decision. If we wanted to get this person, we had to offer benefits. So okay. yeah, Ruby, but we do. Same, so you see no. the two art. You see the two art positions. You also have uh, Hurlbut. Uh, is that a there's a point seven there, and then you know there's the middle school, the part time position. We look to try to have that be the same person. Uh, unfortunately, given sometimes when you're going across buildings, scheduling constraints, you, you can't always you can't always do that. Uh, this was certainly one of those. Circumstances where we could not consolidate, you know, an art, an art teacher here. I mean, for the most part, overall, we've been, as you can see from that list, very effective in being able to do that. This was one that was very challenging, and also when we're, you know, a day or two before the start of the year, trying to get an art teacher and competing with everybody else who's looking for someone. And sometimes you might even think, uh, you know, it could be easier to get part time. It's actually harder. Uh, to find someone, so. Yeah, I, I would I would challenge the, uh, this goes back to Melissa's point of having a staffing and hiring strategy. Well, we it's, do. 
but does it make you know, sense? It's highly to... efficient. I mean, if you look at those, you look at the way we've got the FTE, most of those teachers who are part-time are almost, a lot of them are almost full-time. And so, um, you know, the, the goal is to use the staff because we're on one campus. That is such a, uh, a huge benefit to us from a staffing standpoint, but we do, you know, and I hear this from Patty and Lauren Darren all the time, trying to, you know, use staff across buildings gets really challenging scheduling wise. So we, we try to plan very much in advance to do that. And now this past summer, because we offered staff unpaid leave and things of that nature, we had a lot, we, we had some movement, uh, particularly we had an art teacher, uh, you know, actually retire. Um, uh, we had others who took the, the unpaid leave. We shifted some teachers who were in existing roles to cover um, you know, some of these openings that we had to try to be efficient. And that was, I mean, you know, in terms of our strategies this year, we really had to you know, think creatively about how to, how to staff these, these positions without trying to go out and actually hire um, for every one of those openings that came up. Um, so we did shift a lot of staff to try to address this, but in some cases like this, where you couldn't just have one person across two buildings, unfortunately, we did have to, you know, there isn't an, an extra um, benefits package there. I, I would, I would, um, I would love to continue this conversation in terms of the go forward hiring strategy is the 0.5 because 0.5 at the bare minimum is receiving full time benefits maybe there shouldn't even be a 0.5. It's either a 0.4, which is under the threshold or a 0.6, so we get more out of them. But this 0.5, where they are bare minimum part-time, but yet receiving full-time benefits, in my mind, I think there's, there's an efficiency opportunity here. Mike has joined. Yeah, Mike joined us. Do we have the updated, do we have an updated three-year capital plan including the middle school items? Um, I do not think that, that's it's, it's on CAVE. Um, I don't think I have it to share. I'm it's, sorry. It's posted. It's posted on CAVE. Right. But just, just real quick, in terms of what has changed since the last book, we have added, and we'll have further discussion about this, in terms of new items, we've added a contingency for the middle school age for pairs of $130,000. Hold on we've, for a second. Sure. I think, let's, let's all have it in front of us. It has the date January 13th on top. Is that correct? It does, correct. So it, has a, it should have a total for FY22 of 1,057,400. Mm -hmm. What date is the document attached to? Um, it, was, it was posted, it's on CAVE. Um, I think Andrew shared it and Bill is sharing. I just shared it. Do you all see it? Is this the oh, correct great. one, Bill? Perfect. Yeah, that is the correct one, correct? Thank you, Bill. This is what's posted in CAVE and it's been on CAVE for the last couple of days. Okay, so there's no changes. I saw this one, there's no changes to that, okay. Right, so the new items from what was originally presented, there are items four um, for the contingency, item eight for the sound dampen for the music room, and item 10, um, for a uh, generator at the bus garage. And Mike will fill in with Bill. the details unless we want to have specific questions. Bill, can you increase the size a little bit, please? Just go up to the Zoom here. Yeah, thank you. So only only have items for the middle school this year, nothing next year and the year after. Mike? Well, what I had done here, can you hear me? Am I finally unmuted? Yep. yep. Hey, okay. Mike. Um, is, how are you doing, guys? Um, is, the next two or three years, 
I can't, it's hard for me to put on how we're going to do this in two or three years. The only thing I can do is give us some sort of priority as to where we are. And yes, we have, you know, I have five things on the priority list for middle school for the next two or three years. But these are interchangeable. I mean, these one could be a five, five could, five could be a one. Um, I mean, I could easily throw these on um, for the future years to come. Um, but we kind of need to come up with a plan as to how we want to go forth with this. I mean, I don't think we want to do, I mean, it's as important as upgrading bathrooms are and getting them up to ADA uh, compliance. I'm not sure that we want to get that in the next two or three year plan because we don't know what's going to happen with the, the middle school. It's, I, I don't see it changing, but if the spaces are going to kind of change a little bit, um, it would be nice to do a complete renovation. Um, like, let me just give you, for instance, number five in the sea wing, which is the, which Mike, is the hold hallway on of the old. Mike, one second. Yeah. Bill, can you, can you go to the next page, please, Bill? These are the items that Mike is referring yeah. to. Yeah. Okay. So at Sea Wing, I mean, we have two boys and we have two girls' bathrooms, all within, you know, 25 feet of each other. Um, these are the bathrooms that are used for um, voting, for sporting events, schooling. Um, and these are adjacent to each other. So it'd be really nice to go in and just knock down walls and make larger bathrooms out of them. Instead of having two very tiny stalls for the boys' room along with two urinals, um, or on the other side, you know, you have a couple couple smaller stalls for girls. It'd be nice to open these rooms right wide up and uh, make them larger rooms like we have in the gallery of the high school. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's very hard for me to put this onto a list because if if the optimization committee is going to come in and say that we can, you know, make one bathroom out of two and have two staff and two um, student bathrooms, it's a home run. We should definitely go that route. So for me to put them on one, two, and three, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, hydronic pumps I want immediately um, with the chilled water pumps just because that's how we serve the heating and the cooling for all the HVAC units that are there. Um, the con contingency plan would have to roll on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, we have 14 spaces that have HVAC units, and that's not even considering A-wing, B-wing, and G-wing that have unit ventilators, okay? Um, the, so to put a, put a year on it is very difficult. Okay. Um, especially HVAC, we kind of have to, we have to jump on things as they go down, as opposed to try to, you know, to, we don't want to replace everyone that I have brought through, um, company wise, um, supply house wise, it makes no sense to replace any of these units, these smaller units with an air handler. It should be a rooftop unit, which we can do. Um, but it takes a little bit more engineering to it. Um, we can get a larger rooftop unit to feed many more rooms than what we have with the you know 14 spaces that have 18 uh, air handlers. Um, so that's just the HVAC side of it. The hydronic pumps and chilled water pumps are definitely a priority this year. Um, we might be able to limp through till uh, 22, but the sooner we get on this, the better. Um, my guys have been working. I mean, obviously this is we have a really cold weekend. We've all been all over the place rooftops today. Um, we've had some breakdown. So we, they've had to jump off of getting pricing for me for motors and wheels and shafts and things. But um, that's definitely a priority for that. Um, music room, I think, is a, it's a no-brainer um, for the sound dampening. They're literally dropping for your ceiling tiles. Um, they're two by four, and they can be reused anywhere on campus. Um, may need a little modifying for the WIS because the WIS is all two by two ceiling tiles, but these are all interchangeable anywhere. Um, Art rooms, the sinks, the faucets, the cabinets, the uh, sediment traps to make them function better, they're going to be just like a commercial kitchen. It's going to be very similar to what you see in STEM. Um, instead of a two-bay two sink, it'll be a three-bay sink just so that they can have more kids working when it's, not, when it's a non-COVID year. Um, if they decide to not make that art um, and move things around, they can be reused in any one of our kitchens that will never be taken down. Um, they're, they have multifunction. So that's kind of how I went through the one through five. Just if you as go to up, how we can punch so, these. So, so Mike, if you if you go up to the to the top page, then so the the middle bill. If you go to page two, back up. So then, the middle school items that are you know how are you handling the contingencies? Then how do you? It would just be as we have breakdowns that we we would have some. Um, an allowance that way you could hop right on a motor replacement or to have a shaft built, uh, milled down to size or a wheel replaced. 
That's what the contingency is for, just so that if we have a major breakdown and we have to shut down a unit, whether it's the library, whether it's the cafeteria, whether it's a group of classrooms for science or art, that we can just hop on it immediately and start the repair process. Right. Now, is that a, an allowable, is a contingency, Phil, an allowable capital item? We may have to have, um, we may have to um, have the, the symmetrous sinking fund. We could just have the board um, of, of finance um, create a new account, but I have to double check with Rick if, if this is allowed or not. But I think just overall within the, um, the capital budget, we should be able to do this. And yeah, we have several sinking funds in the town, um, turf replacement, vehicle replacement. Um, it's, it's a fairly common practice. Now, are you going to fill in on page three, you have placeholders, TVDs on those. What, what's the plan for filling those in? Um, we've actually been bringing companies in and supply houses in just to give us some sort of idea of what we're looking at. Yeah. So that's how that pricing is going to go. I mean, I really can't go off anything Silver Petrocelli said. The numbers are so skewed that I, I, we can't base anything on them. Everything that we've ever gone off of has been so far off that it's a waste of time to even use their number. Right. So I'm trying to do it um, with supply houses. We have certain um, contractors that have come in that have been gracious enough to kind of help us out, which like I told you guys in a meeting or two before that they don't like doing anymore because they know that it's just a baseline for repairs and that they wouldn't be allowed to uh, help us out with the bidding process and do the repairs. So I am in process, but like I said, the lab, we've had some breakdowns. Um, so we haven't been able to focus on everything. And used, today I wanted to get a little bit more firmed up with uh, pricing. It's just today it's been one phone call after the other for areas that have been having issues. And with everything going on, we take HVAC as a priority. So if you go back and to- it's, it's also very difficult to get people, it's hard for me to get contractors in because we're not allowing contractors in during the day. So it's, you know, it's a very, it's a very hard time crunch the last couple of weeks trying to make this happen. So if you go back to page two, this is a, you know, obviously there's always a, a uh, um, pretty extensive discussion with the board of finance. Uh, I think this, this is also, um, I think this prioritization Mike, is something that um, the building committee would probably agree with you on? Sure. Yes, is that a yes? Yes, I agree with that. Yes, yes, 100%. Yeah, um, so I don't know if the board members have any questions on this, but this is probably roughly the capital uh, plan that we're gonna go with for discussion with the board of finance. I think it's, you know, probably the three year cost is probably on average built into the towns, you know, what they have in the 10 year projection, although. Yeah, the, the phasing is off. I mean, you're the sitting phasing is with, off, right. with, you know, a six, you know, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars swing every other year. Yeah. Plus the town has capital projects to marry with our funky phasing to the idea yeah. is to have a fairly smooth trend with this. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not opposed to it as long as the town has projects phased so that we end up top line right. relatively yeah. smooth, but this is a little bit of a funky pattern. It is. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, um, just just so everyone knows, a lot of, one of the reasons why it's like this um, is because of pretty much for the facility feasibility study, we deferred a few items from our list and we made a few adjustments. Um, cause initially when we did it, we did, the plan was to have it a smooth, a smooth transition or a smooth number year over year, but with the adjustments or deferrals that we made, um, pending feasibility uh, committee, um, that's why we have that huge shift, um, in the, in the middle of the year. Well, and three items on your year one are from Silver Petricelli, which could technically get moved out once we have a more realistic um, number, correct? Um, I, I think the only item here, no, I think the only item here that is pending that we could have re revised downwards um, when we're waiting for num revised number is items two and three, the the old gym, the air handler and lighten at the high school for 350 and the windowsill replacement project. But I think Mike did mention the last time that what, while we may have, while we may have one project going down, we may see an increase in the, in the other project. 
Mike, can you just talk a little quick about the windowsill project and the high school um, replacement, the, the gym? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so basically on windowsill project, um, I, I apologize. I'm not at desk. I'm not in front of a computer. I don't have a lot of paper with me. Like I said, we have a lot of breakdowns, so I'm kind of back and forth to all the schools. Um, windowsill project, I believe, was 27, uh, 250. Um, we are definitely going to be well above that number. Richard Wolf agrees 100% that that's going to be a very uh, elevated number. We're going to come down. We're going to come in with that project much lower than that, probably less than half. Um, now we're still in process with the the gym, the old gym of the high uh, of the high school. Um, that number certainly is going to go up. It's just how are we going to manage the project and how are we going to get it within the numbers that we need to get it into. Um, so that number is going to probably be on the rise. Are they going to balance out to, for the totals to equal? That we're unsure of. Um, should have a little bit better. There was a building committee meeting last Wednesday. There's another one coming up, not this Wednesday, but following Wednesday. Um, and we'll have a little bit better numbers. The thoughts were to uh, possibly remove the AC out of the, out of the project to get the project down to a um, manageable number with the future add-on of air conditioning. So we're still in process with that, with the building committee, with the engineer and the, uh, the bidding. So that's still unfortunately up in the air. I will get, I will reach out and find out where the pricing is. I was actually just on the phone with Jonathan a little while ago. I'll find out where we are with the pricing for the, um, for the windowsill project to see exactly what kind of number we're looking at or if he's farmed up anything. But unfortunately, those two projects, we don't have solid numbers. Any other questions for Mike? Well, I just have a question for you, Tony. How are we supposed I mean, we have to approve something this week and we have a lot of projects that we don't have firm numbers on. Um, uh, you know what? It's not the first time. <laughs> it's not the first time. I think that the, this, is, this is exactly the conversation we'll have with the Board of Finance, right? Um, do we, you know, will we have firm numbers, Mike, by, you know, March? Oh, certainly. Okay. Certainly. I think we're going to be very close to a firm number, if not this um, upcoming facility committee, uh, building committee meeting, but the following. Um, and I'm assuming I'm going to have to get guys back out here on a weekend to have a look at the space again. Yes, by March, absolutely. We'll be we'll have a solid number both ways. I think we're, we're within a week or two to have a solid number for the, the windowsill project at the WIS. And we're probably, you know, three or so weeks away from getting a solid price and to make a decision as to how we're going to move forward with the, uh, with the high school old gym HVAC window um, project. So I think um, my view, if we can do this, is approve it with the caveat that we might have to come back once there's firm numbers and reapprove. And I apologize with the um, with the inc inconsistent numbers, but we're working with the building committee, which is a which is a tremendous plus. We have a lot of expertise. So the one thing that is not settled upon is the first engineered um, drawing. Um, there's always questions. There's always things that change, and it's for the better of the campus, better of the units. So it may take a you know a few weeks longer than we want. Next year, we may have to get started a little bit earlier. We might need a little bit more time than six months um, to try to get a project in order. So it could be a learning process for us that we need a little bit more time. They will need two years to start looking into a project that would be fine tune it and have the numbers better for beginning of January as opposed to middle of uh, February. But um, it's a lot of expertise and it's a lot of change for the better. Um, so we're not just throwing a system in there that's going to, you know, fail on us. Um, it's going to be adequate. It's going to be the right system. Um, so that is the reasoning for the timing. There's a lot of meetings. There's a lot that goes into it. A lot of walkthroughs. Um, and unfortunately, it is delayed. And like I said, we may need to allow ourselves or I may need to allow more time to get the, the actual project drawn up just a little bit more time. Well, capital is much easier to adjust at a later date since yeah. it's, a single, it's a single vote on each thing on each individual project. So if we need time, let's take it. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. We're back. Um, 12 o'clock, I'd like to keep us on schedule. Um, so 
Just a little bit of housekeeping. Tomorrow we have the public forum. There's also a mod the agenda was modified so that um, we can also do some board work as well. Once, uh, you know, I'm sure you know, the Q and A won't go on for, uh, for the entire time. So we can actually get some work done. Um, maybe go through the Q and A responses that people have questions about. But ultimately, you know, at the end of this week, we're voting on a budget. So, you know, while Ruby, you know, it's not about a number, <laughs> we're voting on a number. Uh, and, and so it is about a number um, because that's what we vote on. So, uh, so let's, you know, we have to be, let's, let's, let's put our finance hat on now um, and think about uh, where, you know, and, and, you know, in the meeting between now and the meeting tomorrow night, think about finally where you want the leadership team to look if anywhere else, because um, if there's more work to do, um, and if we want the leadership team to do more work, um, we should give them that assignment sooner versus later, right? Um, so before we adjourn, is there any other final thoughts or some uh, takeaways for the leadership team at this point that they should take on board? I would just, going back to page 33, the Appendix B and the Q&A, right. um, there are five employees in this district that are at 0.5 getting full-time benefits. I would just um, uh, challenge the leaders to go back and look at that. Uh, is that actionable? Does that mean you want them to come back to you on Thursday evening with a solution or a change? I'm just trying to help them. I mean, ideally, I just, you know, I just don't think we're operating in a very efficient manner, having a staff at a 0.5 and then yet we're paying full time benefits for them. I think we can then utilize them elsewhere. Where else can they be utilized for well, them to? I guess the first question is to, you know, what, you know, without naming names, obviously, what's the typical situation where that happens and why does that happen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's, let's take, for example. And, and, for, and, for is, five, and is five, and is five, and is five, is five the total number or are there 20? Like how many in the district are the part-time 0.5 and with benefits? What's the total number? Per, per what administration gave us, I think it's all on page 33. So they've listed five individuals at 0.5. And Ken alluded to, if you are a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 is when you start to receive full-time benefits. That's correct. If I could just say, let's take the example of a French teacher. We do not have um, you know, the need for a 2.0 French teacher just giving programmatic needs enrollment in the program, but we do have a need for 1.5. Um, you know, it's just that that's where the enrollment breaks out. And it's not like you can, you know, unless you have dual certified teachers, like Lisa alluded to earlier, French and Spanish, we just don't have that in the system where we could flex that person with another, um, you know, another uh, assignment. Uh, unfortunately, it's just, you just get stuck. And then at the, the high school level with a bio person, uh, we don't have the need for a full-time position. Um, but, you know, that, so that's where the need is. And, you know, I think Lisa can add to that one, but we can, I mean, we can go through each of these. Yeah, one thing I would say is sometimes at the high school level, we make the decision. For example, I made the decision to have one of our bio teachers who had been out for um, child rearing to see if she wanted a half time position. And the thought behind that was, if you recall, we had a physics teacher that left and a project lead the way person that left short notice. Um, and we wanted to hire the best physics and best pre-engineering people that we could. And so by having that person gets a little bit complicated, go part-time, and there are other people that are certified in other areas because in science, it's by particular area. We were able to hire a top quality physics person 
and a top quality split physics project lead the way. If not, I don't know what we would have done without other piece of project lead the way who we would have found to be able to do it. So sometimes there's kind of a long method to our actions, if you will, especially when we're talking about at the high school with such high levels of expertise that are needed. Yeah, Lisa, I told, I completely hear you. And, and Ken, I appreciate your comments around French. That totally makes sense too. But when Dan says that hiring this per person was contingent on giving them full-time benefits, that is what I have a problem with. I, for my team, when I hiring and, you know, my, I would never hire someone part-time, but then yet I have to pay them a full-time whatever. So that's where I'm saying we need to just find efficiencies, whether it's across school or whether it's in a particular building. That's my well, challenge. Yeah. So uh, let, I, I might agree. suggest, maybe, may I suggest this? I think for the next meeting, it's right, right around the corner. I think by tomorrow evening in that second part of the public session, as Tony mentioned, we can bring you an explanation across all point fives because we have to be very cautious in a public meeting. I know you're not trying to do this, to have specific discussions about specific employees. And we're starting to go down that path. So I would urge us to have us come back to the board and say, when we have to go to point five, here's why we have done it. Because I can assure you, we don't want to hand out benefit packages if we don't have to. We've worked incredibly hard at that. But this is then the trade-off. It's almost a class size discussion. If you care about high quality in teachers in Weston, there are times where unless you are allowing that kind of 0.5, you don't get the coverage you need and you don't get the best person, but let us come back and we can do it by tomorrow evening, tight and in writing to in a sense, add to this document with not just the line, but a general explanation of how we approach, be it that sub 1.0 appointment, just so you have more clarity on that. Because I can assure you, this term team works incredibly hard to get the best at, at the best price possible and to avoid benefit packages when we can. Uh, but, but let us come back and explain that to you again without going down line by line, job person by job person. Okay. I just want a, a, quick, a quick reminder to everyone, um, based on everything that we discussed earlier, we're currently at 288. Uh, no, I mean, we have the- With a place older for that reduction for that one teacher will be at about 269. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I thought we were, I thought you had asked, Tony, correct me, I thought you'd asked Phil to make that reduction and that we are going to right. think about readjusting right. in July. That's right. Okay. okay, so we so we are at 269. Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll take it up tomorrow night. Um, and and my view is is uh, the only the one thing we haven't done is the Q and A, and then uh, I would probably start it with you know before you even go through the Q and A is other thoughts that board members had on the overall budget. Um, so that if there are things that the leadership team needs to do between now and Thursday's meeting, that they do, they do it. Uh, I'm assuming that there's nothing specific now, but I want everyone to think long and hard about it because we're, we're coming down to uh, next couple of days having to make a decision. Okay. Um, that can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. See everyone tomorrow night. Thank you.